Now I know what you're thinking. Shadow, there's no way you were crazy enough to look at every single backyard sports video game ever made just to cover them all in one single video. But you know what? I am crazy enough. I freaking did it. I definitely have some regrets, but let that stand as a testament to just how dedicated I am to this project. Passion, man. When you have passion on your side, it can be a powerful, driving, creative force. But enough about that. The Backyard Sports series is undeniably Humongous Entertainment's most successful property of all time, which was ultimately to the company's detriment, if you ask me, as somebody who's put a lot of research into the topic. Whether it was baseball, basketball, hockey, one thing is clear. Kids loved the Backyard Sports games back then and continue to remember them fondly whenever the nostalgic memories get triggered by the sheer utterance of the name Pablo Sanchez. Even decades later, when the original company has been dissolved and the games have fallen into a state of limbo, these sports games continue to be referenced and praised because they truly were at the top of their game at one point in time. What many people don't know, however, is what became of the series after its first five years of success. Most people only tend to remember the first backyard baseball, soccer, and football titles, as well as their first re-releases featuring major pro league players, but little do they realize that the rabbit hole goes much, much deeper than that. As such, I have taken it upon myself to cover every single backyard sports video game ever released, from the very first game in 1997 to the most recent title at the time of this video's upload with the iOS and Android mobile games in 2015. For the record, just because I want to preface this, I wrote every single one of these entries in the exact order that you will see them in this video. So, in a way, look at this as sort of a chronicle of how my opinion changed on the Backyard Sports series from the very beginning to the very end. I figured that would be a rather cool experiment and a good way to capture my exact emotions about each game right after I played them. With that said, I don't see any reason to stall any further, so let's just go ahead and dive right into what is the biggest video I've ever made on my channel, bar none, because I just keep outdoing myself. I now present you with the Junior Sports of the Backyard Series, a humongous entertainment retrospective. So back in 1997, arguably the peak year for Humongous Entertainment as a whole, the company decided to introduce three new IPs to the public. The first was Spy Fox, the fourth and final junior adventure series that the company would ever create. The second was Big Thinkers, a mediocre edutainment title that leaned a bit too heavy into the boring educational side of things if you ask me. And the third was a game that while initially experiencing a mixed reception upon its release, eventually became the company's most profitable line of children's games they would ever truly make. Backyard Baseball Backyard Baseball was an idea originating from illustrator Nick Merkovich, who gave the pitch to Humongous co-founder Ron Gilbert somewhere in 1994 if I had to estimate based on what I've read, where it sat undeveloped for nearly a year. He thought of the idea because he noticed sports were a thing that kids played quite frequently, and yet there didn't seem to be any actual computer games that revolved around kids playing sports, so he figured why not let Humongous take a crack at it. The story goes that the game didn't even seem to have a chance until the Seattle Mariners, the local major league team of the company since they were also stationed in Seattle, Washington, started to have a breakout season in 1995. That was the push that gave Ron Gilbert the urge to say, let's give this baseball thing a shot. And so development began. Now, I already went into this in my overall history video of Humongous Entertainment, but one of the biggest driving factors of backyard sports was the multi-ethnic casting. For a sports game released in the 1990s aimed at kids, there's quite a lot of representation present here in the kids with all sorts of backgrounds for both boys and girls alike. It's seriously impressive and definitely gave nearly any kid at least one athlete that they could latch onto in some way, shape, or form. 
Now, backyard sports was never something I fell madly in love with, but I could say the same for sports video games in general. Back on the GameCube, my father had purchased games for me like MVP Baseball 2005 and Tiger Woods PGA Tour 2003, which I spent a fair share of time playing with him, although the most amount of time I think I've spent playing any sports game likely goes to... Well, MLB The Show 2009 on the PlayStation 3. Once again, a game bought by my father, which he hardly ever played and instead went to me. This was the year after the Phillies had won the World Series, and growing up in a Philadelphia fan household meant that that was the best year of my father's life since 1983, the last time any of the four major Philadelphia sports teams had won their sports championship at the time. Of course, as you can imagine, 2018 was another one of those big years. My point in bringing this up up is that I do have a pretty solid familiarity with sports, with baseball and football being my two favorites. Professionally, that is. In terms of recreation, nothing beats running. I don't follow them religiously and know every single team's roster of every year, but I know the rules of the games and have a solid foundation of which teams are typically good, who a lot of the pro athletes are, and I'd say I'm pretty confident talking about these games because I know what they're based on. Now, I never owned backyard baseball. In fact, I never owned any backyard sports games except for one that I'll be getting to at some point in this video. Go ahead and place your bets now as to which one it might be. But I was very aware that it existed as a kid because this two minute backyard baseball baseball video was included with like every single humongous game that was ever released. It certainly made me want to play the game, but alas, I never ended up getting this one. That said, this video is my first time ever experiencing backyard baseball. But I gotta say, I went in expecting the high quality humongous entertainment gameplay, animations, and presentation that I know so well, and boy was I not disappointed. This game still looks amazing despite having been released all the way back in 1997, the year after I was born. That's crazy. Graphically speaking, the animation is surprisingly detailed, especially given how many characters are present on this roster. I know I already commented on the diversity of the cast, but even looking at this from an animation standpoint, something like this is a huge undertaking. It's not like a yearly sports game where you can take a generic 3D human model and then just adjust the height, weight, skin tone, build, etc. with ease. No, every single one of these characters has a different design with different personalities and customized animations pertaining specifically to them for the bench, batting, pitching, stat profiles, the whole shebang. If you know anything about animation, you know that it is a lot of hard work to pull something like that off, especially back in the 1990s when hand-drawn animation was the primary method used to create these games. Having to come up with 30 individual character designs, each with their own distinct traits and idle animations, draw them out by hand, and scan them into the computer, then digitally ink and paint them, it's an incredible feat, and it's a wonder that these games ever came out in the first place. I know I could certainly never pull something like this off. But let's get into the gameplay here, that's what we're really here to talk about. So, unfortunately, given that this is the first backyard sports game, period, there aren't a lot of customizable options available. The only two game modes that exist are the quick play pickup game, or playing through a seasonal league. So this game cuts right into the nitty gritty. Pure baseball gameplay. Now, if you've ever played a single sports game in your life, you know that the quick play option just dumps you right into a game because rosters are usually predetermined based on the major league team chosen. However, because this isn't your typical sports game made up of major league players, the game actually has you alternate back and forth with the computer, picking players elementary school playground style. Starting up a season, on the other hand, will let you pick your full team roster before going into a 14 game league where you play game after game building up a team record and hopefully doing well enough to make it to the playoffs and go all the way to win the championship where you unlock exclusive sports fields. Something like that is certainly a time sink though, so if you decide to go the seasonal route, expect to dump a ton of hours into the game just for one league of play. I was half tempted to go all the way in the league that I started and show off what it looks like when you win the championship, but when I have as many backyard sports titles to go over as I do, I knew I wouldn't have the time, so I decided that I was going to borrow some footage from this this YouTube channel here so that I could show it off. I will be doing this for several games throughout the video because quite frankly, if you wanted me to do a 100% complete run of all of these games for this video, it wouldn't be done for another two years. <laughs> 
So, this here was my chosen roster for the season that I at least started. I decided to name my team the Humongous Rockets and chose the color purple as an homage to the developers of the game, and you better believe my first pick was the obvious choice, Pablo Sanchez. Pablo, as anyone would know, is the Christopher Robin of Backyard Sports. I mean, this kid literally has Secret Weapon as his nickname. How subtle. He is literally a deity in baseball kid form. As far as game options go, it actually gives a lot for the players to work with though. Games can be played over 6 or 9 innings, a t-ball option is available for younger players who may be having trouble timing their swings, and the pitch visibility can be adjusted which I'll be getting to with the core gameplay mechanics. There are a few different difficulty modes as well, and a red tab that allows you to switch to either batting practice mode or a spectator mode where the computer plays for both teams and you can just kick back and watch the game. Backyard Baseball comes with a few different sound settings and let me just say right now, turn the chatter off. Oh my gosh, I get what this option was going for because in-game the players mock the batter like typical kids would on the playground, but the problem is that they never shut up. It's cute for all of 10 seconds before you just get tired of hearing the same lines over and over again cutting on top of each other. It's not even like there's a pause in between them. No, these kids just keep screaming over each other. Like, I just can't. Turn off the chatter. You'll thank me later. And you know it's bad when the cutting room floor's opening paragraph on this game's page is mocking this exact problem. But Backyard Baseball also comes with a feature that introduces another one of its stapled characters in the form of its sports commentators. Let's get the party started! It's time to get down with your favorite baseball players! I'm Sunny Day, and together with my pal, Vinny the Gooch... Uh-oh. Well, that's an unfortunate nickname. Sunny Day is essentially this franchise's recurring non-athlete character, as she will be appearing in almost every backyard sports game in the entire series, with the second commentator being swapped in and out depending on the sport. Sunny Day was actually voiced by the then-amateur voice actress Jen Taylor. Of course, her career has gone quite a ways since then, seeing as some of her most recognizable roles are voicing Princess Peach from Super Mario and Cortana from the Halo franchise. It's cool to see how far she's come, knowing that she kind of got her start here with Backyard Sports. Backyard Baseball features 10 different fields to choose from, each with their own pros and cons. Playground Commons, which is your typical ball field. Sandy Flats, which is probably the most dreadful in the entire game given that it slows down everything on the ground, players and baseballs alike. Tin Can Alley, which has giant walls on both sides, preventing home runs from being achievable. Cement Gardens, which is like a better Tin Can Alley with more personality given the makeshift bases. Dirt Yards, which isn't all that special if you ask me, Ackman Acres is this nice peaceful neighborhood backyard that gives off a cozy vibe, Steel Stadium, which is arguably the best field in the game, Parks Department number 2, which is just a nice stadium-like ball field that you can unlock throughout the game, and then the two other unlockable fields in the form of the Big City Stadium and the Super Colossal Dome, which are obtained once you make it to the playoffs and final championship respectively. Speaking of unlockables, there's also an unlockable character hidden in the game, coming in the form of none other than Mr. Clanky, who can be unlocked by holding shift and clicking on the little icon of him on the menu screen. He is of course only selectable in single play mode, but even still it's cool that there's actually a hidden character in the game. And he's a recurring one at that, meaning he will be returning in several future games as we'll be seeing throughout this retrospective. Apologies if it feels like I just spent a good chunk of time going over what was essentially the option options menu, but here's the thing. 99% of sports games play the same exact way, and as we go along you'll start to see that Backyard Sports is no exception, so I primarily want to highlight the differences where they exist to demonstrate what sets these games apart from the rest, because at the end of the day, a baseball video game is most likely gonna play like baseball, and that's hardly going to change. It's the other elements surrounding it that gives each game the potential for a distinguishable personality. As far as the core gameplay goes, this game follows most of the same rules that actual baseball would follow, so if you're looking for the official rules of how to play the sport, I suggest looking that up because I'm writing this with the assumption that one understands how the original sport I'm talking about is played, at least to a moderate extent. Two teams take turns hitting and fielding with the player getting to take control of their team for both sides of the innings. 
Hitting is pretty straightforward. When you're on the offensive, you have the ability to choose from a couple different swing types, including a power swing, line drive, grounder, and bunt, as well as choosing a batting stance that influences the direction in which the player at bat will aim their swing. What sets backyard baseball apart from most of the sports video games I've played is that the player can easily influence where they aim their swing with their bat using the mouse and clicking in the rough area of where the pitch is estimated to land in the catcher's mitt. The game provides an estimate of where the pitch is going to land using this black circle inside the strike zone, prompting the player to roughly guess where the ball will pass through. However, this is simply an estimate, so depending on the size of the circle, the ball may land in the dead center of the black circle, or it could end up on the the outer edge. I actually really appreciate this because it gives the player a reasonable chance at aiming their swing without necessarily guaranteeing that they will make contact, especially because if the player is just slightly off, it will usually result in a foul ball. You can, however, turn on the pitch locator option to show exactly where the pitch will land inside the strike zone, just in case this is giving you a bit too much trouble. I can't believe I'm saying this about a humongous entertainment game, but this mechanic makes the actual gameplay feel realistic in the way it asks the player to estimate where the ball is going to pass by. I can't speak for modern sports games anymore, but from the ones I played as a kid and teenager, I can say that this has more enticing swinging mechanics than those games by a long shot, because in those, all you had to do was press a button and not really think about aiming where you were swinging. Obviously, the type of swing chosen also influences how the character will hit, as well as their corresponding hitting stat, so that's something to bear in mind as well. Ergo, a character like Pablo Sanchez can hit just about anything, but I also had Vicky Kawaguchi on my team who had an incredible running speed but a terrible batting game, so I chose to rely on her hitting line drives to get on base and then just rock it around the bags in no time flat. The game may look simplistic, but there still is an element of strategic play involved that requires the player to know their team. After all, the game has four primary stats that each player has different strengths and weaknesses in. Pitching, hitting, fielding, and running. Keep that in mind because you will want to play your team accordingly to capitalize on each player's strengths as much as possible. Obviously, an athlete with a low pitching stat should never appear on the mound, whereas a character with a maximum hitting stat is the one you're going to want to take power swings with wherever possible. Conveniently, the player can pause the game at any time and look at their team's stats, so the game is generous enough to provide that option for those that are still learning each character's skill traits. Once the player gets a hit, the camera cuts to this overhead view of the field as each of the players appear in a digital sprite form in their respective fielding positions. Controlling the runners is as simple as clicking on the next base in their line of sight and letting the game take it from there. Fielding, on the other hand, requires the player to run wherever the ball is headed and click on the field in the respective position, then of course throwing the ball requires the player to click on the respective teammate that's meant to receive it. There is an element of errors present in the game that I never personally experienced too much, although the computer sure did. I'm pretty confident that the likelihood of error is based upon a player's fielding stats, so the higher that that is, the better off they will be, I think. That of course brings us to the final gameplay element I have yet to discuss, pitching. For my starting pitcher, I chose Kenny Kawaguchi because Kenny has always been one of my favorite characters in backyard sports. Him and Ahmed Khan go hand in hand as my two usual favorites. Well, and Pablo, of course. Pitching is relatively easy to pull off as well here. It's as simple as choosing the pitch type and aiming in the strike zone wherever you wish it to land. Just keep in mind that that black circle area is still in effect for your team as well, so there may be instances where the player ends up throwing a ball despite most of the circle appearing in the strike zone. There are different pitching types available which can influence the way in which a pitch is thrown, both the direction and speed, and power-up pitches can also be unlocked by pitching well and throwing strikeouts, granting you access to things like the elevator pitch which causes the ball to fluctuate up and down, or the meteor pitch which just rockets right by the batter. There's quite a lot of cartoony options available here, but one thing to keep in mind is the juice meter located on the right hand side, which shows how much, well, juice the pitcher still has left in them. Special pitches do come with the drawback of draining more juice than a regular pitch. However, juice can also be recovered occasionally when the cooler icon makes itself apparent, as well as in between innings. If the pitcher's juice gets too low, a new player will need to be swapped in to substitute for them, so I recommend having a couple good pitcher characters on your 
your team at any given time. I'd recommend going for three at least, just to be safe. And yeah, that just about sums up the pitching mechanics in a nutshell, so honestly, there's not much more to add beyond that. Backyard Baseball is a fun, simple, cartoony PC baseball game from the 1990s that has aged exceptionally well and still holds up to this very day. One of the aiding factors of this is that, while some professional players are mentioned in passing dialogue, they aren't playable in this game, so the roster of players never feels outdated because this is a wholly original cast of characters made for this title specifically. That is a huge distinguishing factor that sets it apart from so many other successful sports games out there and definitely deserves to be recognized for that. Unfortunately, there is no real story mode or optional side modes here. It literally is just playing games of baseball or batting practice, I guess, if you choose that in the options menu. But aside from that, I've covered backyard baseball pretty succinctly, I'd say. I still recommend checking out the original game as it is quite a fun time from start to finish, and definitely a testament to Humongous Entertainment's versatility when it came to game development. It's shocking that the game didn't perform that well upon its first release, and that it took until the next upcoming sports game before the series really took off. Adventure games, arcade games, and sports games? Yeah, back then, this software company was a force to be reckoned with. Take a swing, why don't you? Become swing. center. The pitch. Send him back. The swing. Power. Be bunted. Hey kid, Ooh. you're all right, you know. Got it. Throw it to first. Oh, oh, oh. That throw is a hopper. Zinger to third. Save the third. Jump it to third. He just dropped it. Let's Sometimes go. he just Let's can't go. hang on to that ball. Let's Here's go. the throw home. And over to third. Oh. There's no, no way you'll be able to catch that. Good job. Throws it over. This okay, one's gonna get over his head. So Did he just drop the ball? And Let's over go. to third. Did he just drop the ball? Wait a Sometimes go, he just can't hang on to that ball. Now that's what I call togetherness. Ooh, ooh. That could have been epic, but it wasn't. So despite Backyard Baseball's average reception during its first year, Humongous wasn't giving up on its potential just yet. As with many of its titles, Ron Gilbert was adamant about his rule of three, as he called it. If the franchise wasn't successful by the third game, then it was time to can it, but until then they were going to keep trying. One year later, in 1998, the company went ahead and launched a follow-up sports title in the form of Backyard Soccer, taking the original cast of characters from the previous game and throwing them into a different sport with the same general gaming structure. Two modes of play in the form of pickup games and season leagues. Now, seeing as I already covered a lot of the franchise's attributes in the Backyard Baseball section, addressing things like the general cast and animation and the like would be redundant, so going forward, none of these sections will probably be as long as the 1997 Backyard Baseball section, as I will solely be focusing on the differences that sets each title apart from other sports titles, and later, what differentiates them from repeats of the same sport. So, so, Backyard Soccer, what's new here? Well, for starters, our boy Pablo Sanchez was heavily nerfed, going from nearly maxed out stats to being an above average character. Which isn't the end of the world because he's still one of the quickest characters on the field, but his shooting accuracy could be a little bit better. Heads up field, picks his target, out of play, that'll be blue ball. Not really a quality finish there. All of the kids' stats have been adjusted for this new sport though, not just Pablo, so just because a player was one of the best in baseball doesn't necessarily mean they're just as great when it comes to soccer. Honestly, this type of balancing is great because, as with real kids, everyone has some sports they're good at and others not as much. Seasonal play follows the exact same structure with a player being able to draft their team from the bench using whatever players they want. Of course, for my season, I had to go with my OG squad of Pablo Sanchez, Kenny Kawaguchi, Ahmed Khan, and Stephanie Morgan, who's an incredible goalie, by the way. I was considering Jorge Garcia for my team at one point, but I ended up deciding to turn him down. I will play on your team if you ask me nicely. You have insulted my family. Only, it's only game. Why you have to be mad? 
Jeez, Jorge, it's just a game, man. The other four members of my team was comprised of Vicky Kawaguchi, Dante Robinson, Lisa Crockett, and my new team member, Ricky Johnson. The best offensive player without question. Ricky's kicking stat is through the roof and led to him being near perfect with his accuracy and made using the power-up kicks extra guaranteed to score. I only played the first two matches of the season for this video, so I didn't get too far in to see what the seasonal shootout would be like, but it was still enough to get a general feel for what the game plays like. Interestingly enough, Backyard Soccer actually comes with a bit more customization when it comes to setting up the game. There are still modes to choose from between a singles match and a seasonal play, as I mentioned earlier, but most importantly is your choice of control scheme. You can either play the game with every action map to the left click button, or split the commands between left and right click on the mouse should you decide to go with that scheme. However, you also have the option for controller support and keyboard support if you decide to go that route. By default, the game is set to the one button mouse mode, but I prefer using two buttons because it gives me better control over what my players do, I've found. One button isn't too bad, however, you just have to be mindful of how far ahead of the character you click on screen. The chatter was also incredibly toned down compared to Backyard Baseball to where I didn't really even feel the need to turn it off. Sound options are the same as before, so nothing new there, and there are multiple gameplay options such as difficulty, game length, shot kick indicator, and so on that can also be enabled or disabled at every player's leisure. Team name and uniform customization is similar to before, where you can choose the same general mascots and adjectives, but what's really cool is you can actually pick two colors for your uniforms now, which provides for some more customization combinations. Once again, the games are commentated over by Sunny Day, although this time around Vinny is not making a return as he is in instead replaced by new co-commentator Earl Grey, and he drinks a lot of tea. Welcome to another action-packed season of Backyard Suckers Thrills and Spills! This is Sunny Day here, ready to bring you another exciting game here at Parks Department Field number 7. Joining me is my esteemed colleague from across the pond, Earl Grey. Get it, cause he's Brit? Yes, Sonny and Earl provide commentary over the games, which is nice to listen to while you run around the field chasing after this darn soccer ball for however long you need to. The game obviously operates on actual soccer rules and even includes penalties such as offsides and tackling, which I think is a partially random element that I didn't feel like I had a lot of control over. There were times when players would just steal the ball no problem, but other times they would go in for a sliding tackle and I I don't really know what triggered it. Oh, and Mr. Clanky returns once again as the referee for this game, so that's pretty neat. Would have been cool if he was seen on the sidelines of the field or something like that where he was monitoring the game, but oh well, no harm, no foul. Speaking of fields though, Backyard Soccer does repeat the same seven default environments that existed in Backyard Baseball and introduces an eighth stadium on top of that as well, a fully indoor field with glass walls on the sides to prevent the ball from ever going out of bounds named The Vacant Warehouse. I really like the aesthetic of this one, and I'm really glad they introduced it for this game. The entire concept of an indoor field where there's no out of bounds really keeps the game constantly moving and prevents the pace from being broken up. Of course, there are extra hidden fields in this game too, although this time around there are actually a lot of them because they are mostly the home of teams that you end up playing against in seasonal play once you make it out of the first division. They're cool, but they're largely just reskins of the same field over and over again rather than wholly unique. But regardless, there is also the Championship Stadium, which is another one of those walled-in fields. So again, pretty cool. And once you win the highest division, you unlock the credits of the game, which consists of images of the backyard kids having a blast at a pizza party in celebration of their victory. So really cool getting to see the athletes you'd chosen doing all sorts of fun things around the pizza shop. Oh, and I guess I should mention that Backyard Baseball's credit screen consisted of the team roster standing in front of a bunch of different backgrounds. So yeah, honestly not as exciting as the pizza party, which is why I didn't bring it up in that section. Now, the last major attribute of Backyard Soccer that I wanted to bring up is the penalty kicks, as this really is the only time you actually get to see the bigger hand-drawn versions of the characters, as opposed to watching their pixelated forms run across the screen. Similarly to how you control your pitching in Backyard Baseball, you have a few different kick variations to choose from. As the kicking team, simply choose a kick type, click on the ball, and then click somewhere in the goal to aim the shot. The only drawback is that you can't aim your shot until after you start the kick, so you need to be pretty quick with your reaction time to make the shot exactly where you want it to go. As the goalie, 
Luckily, it's as simple as attempting to click wherever the player is kicking the ball, but I don't know if it's just me or not. Sometimes, despite the fact that I clearly clicked exactly where the computer kicked the ball at, the goalie will still miss the shot by a landslide, so it, this isn't necessarily the most reliable. I find that if you just aim your shots in the top corners of the goal, the goalie rarely ever ends up blocking it. But hey, that's only one major gripe for an otherwise solid game. And that's backyard soccer for you. Really, it's the exact same concept from the first game applied to a different type of sport, and it's pretty well made. I enjoyed experiencing backyard soccer here, despite having like no interest in the sport whatsoever. I played soccer as a kid when I was like in preschool, and I hated it, so that has pretty much led to me having no investment in soccer whatsoever for the rest of my life. Nothing against those that do, it's just not my thing, but Regardless of that, I can recommend the game just like I could Backyard Baseball. I wish there were a few extra game modes and also the power-ups would have been cooler if they were a bit more frequent. I hardly mentioned those, didn't I? Yeah, I got like two power-ups in my entire experience playing this game and didn't even get to use one of them, so that was a little disappointing. That aside, however, yeah, it's a fun game. If you're more of a soccer person than a baseball one, give it a try. You might really like it. Manages to keep it in play. Takes it! It's in the back of the net! That's one for the good guy. According to one humongous alumni, Ron Gilbert and the company used to love to work in threes. Three Pajama Sam games, three Junior Field Trips, three Spy Fox games, Big Thinkers was planned to be three games, and here we have the third entry in the Backyard Sports series. Rounding out the original trilogy of Backyard Sports titles comes Backyard Football, a game that I personally do not find to be all that enjoyable, as you'll soon see. By this point, you probably get the gist of what the game looks like, seeing as the same cast of Backyard Kids return once again is the roster of this game, although Backyard Football does bring something new to the table in the sense that it is the first backyard sports game in the franchise to be made in conjunction with a major league sports organization, in this case it obviously being the NFL. This partnership, not sure if it's the correct term for it, but for lack of a better one, allowed Humongous to include official NFL teams in the game, leading to a mix of real-life football teams and cartoony made-up teams Humongous originally crafted for themselves. I personally still stuck to the original teams, which led to some pretty weird matchups seeing the New England Patriots go up against the humongous Rockets. But official sports teams aren't the only addition that this partnership brought, it also brought some players to the game too. Dan Marino, Brett Favre, Steve Young, there's a few different NFL stars here that players can add to their team at any point in the game. The only issue that I really have with this inclusion is that all of these players are pretty much the best players in the entire game, aside from Pablo Sanchez of course, and completely decimate most of these kids' stats wise, which discourages me from choosing them. At the same time, it's no fun picking all of these NFL All-Stars just to steamroll everything, so I chose a happy medium when drafting my seasonal team and only selected two for it. Strangely enough, Backyard Football is only a 5-on-5 five -five game, having the least amount of available players on a team in the whole trilogy, but that didn't stop me from choosing my OG trio of Pablo, Ahmed, and Kenny. Unfortunately, I had to give Stephanie the shaft in favor of Ricky, who once again has one of the best kicking stats in the entire game. And then of course, the last few spots went to Randall Cunningham, Brett Favre, and Tony Del Vecchio. So yeah, game mode wise, it's the same thing as before with quick play, pickup games, and seasonal play. Trophy are placed in the trophy case and you can view the player stats at any time in the player card book. One new addition to the main menu of the game, however, is that of the Junior Sports League, which unfortunately hasn't existed for a very, very long time, therefore I have no way of capturing footage of it, but basically this was an online service Humongous had where kids could actually get online and play against other kids using the Junior Sports League network. It was ahead of its time back in 1999, and unfortunately I never got to experience this because I was too young to go on the internet at that time. Online gaming in 1999. 
Huh, I wonder how well it ran. Unfortunately, this service is going to remain defunct until the end of time unless somehow the fans find a way to revive it, but I thought it was worth mentioning this since it was a new feature introduced by Backyard Football. But enough about that, let's get into the actual gameplay. 16, 42, hike! Angles it up the middle, knifing through! It's a foot race! The 20! Touchdown! The defense uh, looked confused on that one. It's pretty weak. I don't know, maybe it's just me, but I find this to be the least fun junior sports game of the trilogy because it feels like I have even less control over what my players actually do. The view of the game is a lot more zoomed in on the football field compared to the camera distance on backyard soccer, and the character models are all a bit harder to distinguish thanks to the helmets that obscure their heads and hair. Second and long, hands it off, runs to the... He's going to pass it! And it drops incomplete! Also, every time I go to make a play in this game, it feels like things are up to random chance all the time. It is really hard to distinguish when a player is going to catch the ball versus when it's an interception, what determines when a player will fumble. Back to throw! Caught! It was wide open! That oh, is a free ball! Exactly. You just gotta jump on that ball. Sometimes big guys try to pick it up and run with it, and that's when trouble starts. I'm not sure if there's any real strategy to making accurate field goals other than making sure the kick meter is high enough. I don't know, I feel like this game plays itself a lot of the time and the only thing I can influence is one character's position on the field. And don't get me started on the Sonic Boom power-up either. In the past two humongous games, power-ups were prevalent and usually aided whoever used them to edge their team along, but in this game, the Sonic Boom power is just straight up broken because as soon as you hike the ball, the entire opposing team gets knocked to the ground and they stay down for an immense amount of time. Starting from the 42-yard line. Whoa! Looks like the offense just used a devastating sonic boom play to oh, knock the defense flat! He is in! That's a real lot of yards! I mean, this is basically just a guaranteed touchdown, really, because I don't know how any defensive team is supposed to recover from that. At least in backyard baseball, it was still possible to hit most power-up pitches, and even then with the meteor pitch, that's just one guaranteed strike for a potentially one out. The player still has other pitches to react to. It doesn't give the offensive team a chance to score, and the batting team still has to make contact with the ball to use their special swing, so it's not like it's a guaranteed hit there either. At least in the case of backyard soccer, the player still needed to line up in view of the goal and make an accurate kick before the ball got stolen from them, and accuracy was important there too because there was definitely still a chance of missing the goal entirely. Plus, power-ups were also far less frequent in backyard soccer too. But here? No, the Sonic Boom play is just an automatic win button with no effort required other than clicking once. It also bothers me how long the game takes to load in between every single play. In the previous two backyard sports titles, the game's loading was practically instant with how fast it would pull up the field, but here it takes several seconds in between every single play, which might be a minor issue to some, but that time spent waiting adds up quick over the course of the game. And then when you consider how much time you'll spend waiting over the course of an in-game season, yikes. Drew swings it! Incomplete! Brings up second down! I'm not sure why this happens, but I'm not a fan of it. It just causes the game to drag out longer than it already does. That's not to say this game is outright bad. Believe me, it's not. It still plays like a backyard sports game with the player clicking around on the field to have their characters pass the ball or run or tackle somebody. It's just the unpredictable and illegible interactions between players on the field that made this less fun for me because it's not like soccer where it's easy to tell why a player had the ball stolen from them. Here the players just stack up and layer on top of each other and overlap, making it very hard to distinguish. Great. On the give, it squirted out! The monsters recovered it! Again, I don't know what caused that player to fumble right there because I could not see it. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I really didn't find myself enjoying backyard football nearly as much as the other two sports games. And another thing, the fact that I can't throw further beyond the edges of the screen means I can't wait too long for a player to go deep. If they get to the edge before the ball reaches them, they have to turn around and stop, wait to catch the ball, and then turn around and start moving again. That's not how wide receivers play actual football when they go for a long pass. They run with the ball. They don't just stand there while the defender gets up in their face. 
Backyard Soccer did not have this issue. If I wanted to take a long shot off screen, I could click all the way to the edge and the ball would continue going past that point. Football does not really allow for that because once the ball hits the ground, the play is over. And yet, from what I've seen, the computer doesn't even have to worry about the screen barrier, which gives them a bit of an unfair advantage that the player can't use. We'll start at the 46. Drops back to pass. Drew rifles a pass. It's intercepted. I'm sorry, I just don't think that Backyard Football was nearly as well made as the other two games. I suppose one final note worth mentioning is that Sunny Day returns to commentate once again, this time joined by her associate Chuck Downfield, as the two talk over the play-by-play -play of the game. Thanks, Sonny. It's good to be back in the broadcast booth with you. Well, I think a big problem these kids got today is they play those computer games, like those football ones that they got now, and they think they can go out and play the real thing. Take it for me, buddy. The backyard football is nothing like some little computer game. There's also only five stadiums to choose from in this game as opposed to the seven in baseball and eight in soccer, so that was a little lame as well. The game did at least introduce the weather system so that there was potential for rain or snow to take effect in some games. So despite there only being five locations, there are actually 15 potential field combinations that you could get. And then of course there's the cereal bowl field, which is the game's equivalent of the Super Bowl. And once you beat the game, the kids all go on a field trip to the local amusement park. Can I recommend backyard football? Well, I guess, but only if you're a football fan, because this game just isn't nearly as player friendly as baseball or soccer, at least in my experience. They're going to let this one bounce. Receives it at the 11. He let go of it. Despite my enjoyment of watching the actual sport in question, I just don't find this game to be all that fun to play. Still, I think the most admirable trait that this game had was its online feature back in the day, but seeing as Humongous is completely defunct and those servers are wiped from existence, that sadly has no function in the game's present state. And I can only imagine how slow it ran given internet speeds back then. Backyard Football is kind of like the Pajama Sam 3 of the original Backyard Sports trilogy. It's fine, but it has more problems than the other two. Drops back to pass, fired into the flat, in the clear. He is in! Following the release of Backyard Football and completion of the trilogy of sports games, Humongous had realized they had something good going for them here as the Backyard Sports franchise as a whole was gaining a lot of traction as more and more consumers started purchasing these three games going into the new millennium. We are also beyond the point in time that GT Interactive went out of business and Infogrames decided to come swooping in to pick up whatever pieces they could with Backyard Sports in particular on their radar. Little did Humongous know at that point in their initial three sports games made out of love and creativity would end up becoming their parent company's cash cow for the next 10 years. But before we head into the darker territory, we've got some re-releases to talk about first. Seeing as all three of these titles are essentially just updated versions of the games that I had already talked about, I'm grouping all of them into the same section together just to go over the basic changes between them and their original counterparts. So starting with Backyard Baseball 2001, and this one probably had the most updates out of all three games. The same general gameplay remains the same as before, but the overall look and visuals have been improved in a lot of places, specifically the menus and fielding gameplay. A new user interface is present here when it comes to accessing the game's settings, roster, statistics, and so on by taking this manila folder appearance, while the player's bio cards have also received a bit of an update as 3D graphics have started to become prevalent. 
One thing you'll notice about the general gameplay of Backyard Baseball 2001 is that whenever perspective switches from the batting view to the fielding view, all of the characters have received updated models that are no longer in the form of 2D sprites, but rather compressed 3D models that roam around the field. Of course, controls function the exact same way they did in the original, with each player going up to bat and having different swing options available to choose from while the pitcher can throw the ball using a variety of different pitch types to try and fake out the batter. The batter's box, ball reticle, and user interface have also also received a makeover, but a lot of the backyard sports kids retain the same exact animations they had as before. Instead, the animation budget was put towards the newcomers to the backyard sports series here in this game, professional major league baseball athletes that were popular around that point in time. Ken Griffey Jr., Kurt Schilling, Barry Bonds, Mark McGuire. Wow, these are names I haven't thought about in a long time. But yeah, taking a page out of backyard football resulted in getting to use official professional athletes in their humble point-and-click sports game, which was a really big deal given Humongous at one point was just a small handful of like a dozen people making a game about a talking purple car going to a parade. Oh, how far the company has come. Unfortunately, however, because of this integration between real world players and the backyard sports kids, the actual athletes outshine like 80% of the kids thanks to their far superior stats. Hi. Of course you want me on your team. Who wouldn't? Aside from Pablo Sanchez, of course, he's still the best character in the game, but where certain players used to shine, they no longer do, as they have gotten overshadowed by the big league names. I don't know. Well, on one hand, I think the introduction of real-world athletes is novel and cool. At the same time, I think it takes away the spotlight from the classic cast and causes it to lose some of its charm and identity. What used to be a wholly original sports game has become infected with the professional virus, as I call it, that relies heavily on the recognizable athletes to push sales for the game. Plus, as we're seeing now, it heavily dates the product because all of these players have since aged and retired from the sport. Also, the fact that Major League Baseball consists only of male athletes means that no new female characters were added to this game. Even as a baseball fan familiar with a lot of these players thanks to watching them as I was growing up, I much prefer the original title even if I like the updated user interface and quality of life changes. I just find that the professional athletes kind of takes away some of the original identity. And I find that the base running and control of the characters is more responsive here than the first title though, but otherwise this is more of the same so there's not too much more I have to add. Based on what I've seen online, Baseball 2001 seems to be the most popular version of Backyard Baseball as most of the time this game was included in a discussion. Hey, it certainly resonates with a lot of people and overall yeah I would say it fixes a lot of the issues that were present in the 1997 game, but to me... The inclusion of the pros just overshadows everything else. Now, as for backyard soccer... The same exact changes can be said for it as well, which had the same manila folder user interface update as well as all of the professional MLS teams featured in the game here. What's really cool though is that Humongous actually got to introduce both professional male and female players, whereas with baseball, seeing as the MLB only consists of males, there wasn't really an opportunity for them to do so. Personally, I think that is super worthy of recognition given that female sports leagues don't get nearly as much attention from the general public that the male sports leagues do. I'm not really all that familiar with major league soccer as I don't really care for it, but believe it or not, out of all the backyard sports games in existence, yep, this one right here was the one I had as a kid, so if anybody guessed Backyard Soccer Major League Soccer Edition, congratulations, you won. Not baseball, not football, Backyard Soccer was my one and only experience with the Backyard Sports franchise. That being said, I've got a bit of a soft spot for it. Although, after playing the original Backyard Soccer, yeah, I can see why there were only some basic quality of life improvements here as well because the game plays exactly as it did before, except with 3D models instead of 2D sprites. It's good, but it also has the same problem with the professional players being way better than the original kids, so there's not really a good balance between the two sides. I suppose it's also briefly worth mentioning that the Major League Soccer version of Backyard Soccer also saw a release on the PlayStation 1, although 
although it's vastly inferior to the original version of the game. The animation and visuals had to be compressed due to the limited technology of the PlayStation 1 at the time, and it results in everything appearing more pixelated, almost unfinished looking. Looks like Pajama Sam 3 wasn't the only humongous game to be ported from PC to console, although this is the only other game in which this has happened, so it was still a pretty rare occurrence. This port was actually done by RuneCraft, not Humongous themselves, and it's a pretty lukewarm job at best if I'm being honest. In theory, it should play exactly like how it does on PC, except instead of having the option to use a mouse or keyboard, you are forced to use a controller in which each of the face buttons performs a different action. Unfortunately though, presentation-wise, it's pretty unappealing to look at. The load times are PS1 load times, which means it takes quite a bit of time to get started, Sunny Day and Earl Grey's animations are also reduced, and the user interface is very unappealing to look at both in the menus and the game itself. It also chugs to make matters worse. Yeah, honestly, do yourself a favor and just avoid this version of the game. Playing it on PC will always be a more satisfying experience for you. Take my word for it. Last but not least, Backyard Football 2002. By this point in time, Infogrames had already laid off a ton of humongous employees and decided that they were going to have the company solely focus on backyard sports for the foreseeable future. And Backyard Football 2002 was the first start of that. Technically, Backyard Soccer was the first sports game to release after the layoffs had happened, but I'm also inclined to believe it was in development prior to that event, seeing as it was only released three months later and the development cycle on these games definitely took longer than that to go from start to the final product hitting store shelves. Backyard Football 2002 has the same updates that baseball and soccer were given with a slightly different look going for this digital navy blue rather than the manila folder visuals, but the same player stats screens and inclusion of NFL players holds true just like in the other two games. This time around there are a lot more professional athletes to choose from as opposed to the initial eight seen in the first game. If you want the best, you should pick me. Regardless, I still think the gameplay is bad. Very little changes seem to have been made to how this one plays. I still can't determine when a player will catch a ball versus when it's a block or interception. Controlling your team members is clunky as heck, which is especially weird because I have no trouble at all switching between players in backyard soccer, and I straight up just don't enjoy the way this plays. I've played other football games before on both handhelds like the Game Boy Advance to actual home consoles like the GameCube, so I'm not inexperienced when it comes to these games, but those all feature featured over-the-shoulder cams rather than these sideways aerial views that mimic how they're usually broadcast on TV. So, I don't know, maybe it's just the camera angle. Hi, Mississippi! Who Mississippi? Green Mississippi! Steve, what is it? Couldn't hold it. I guess I just find it very shocking how difficult I find it is to be able to do anything in this game because I'm pretty quick to adapting to the way any game plays. There's just something about this, whether it's the randomness element or the general programming that doesn't work for me. I hate to be so negative about backyard football because I know it has its fans, but to me, it's just a bad game in my eyes. The players don't do what I want them to do half the time with the plays I pick, and they just stand around while the computer players run right past them. I mean, look at this footage. Nothing why didn't she run after the person with the ball? She could have tackled them easily and prevented a touchdown, but instead she just stood there. I didn't control that, I had no say in that. Backyard soccer doesn't have this problem. When someone has the ball, the computer controls your other team members and moves one of them closer to the player that has the ball so that they can attempt to block or steal a shot, or let the player switch to them so they can do that themselves. Why doesn't football do the same thing? Maybe I've just been unlucky and had bad experiences playing this, but it's happened in both versions 
versions of the game while I was recording footage for this video, so I don't think it's a coincidence. I'm not trying to upset any backyard football fans out there, and if there are people that like these games, then good for them. But if I had to personally rate this, it would be the worst of the three sports games by at least two letter grades. Not a fan of it. Not one bit. Honestly, I'll probably never play this game again. Two Mississippi, I got three Mississippi. It. Guns it. The 20! Following the re-releases of the original trilogy of backyard sports games, Humongous was preparing to take their franchise to the next level by introducing another sport into the mix in the form of basketball. Thus, here we have the original Backyard Basketball, or as I'll be referring to it as, Backyard Basketball 2001, the first of its kind. Just booting up the game, you can already tell it's in a similar vein to Baseball 2001 and Soccer MLS Edition because it opens with a cutscene of the characters playing basketball, features the same manila folder appearance in the menu screens, and once again reuses the treehouse layout as the main hub with the same options as usual. Quick play, seasonal league, and being able to view the players in the game. Thankfully, Basketball 2001 follows the trend of Football 1999 in the sense that it doesn't feature an overabundance of professional league players. In fact, there are only two in the entire game, Kevin Garnett and Lisa Leslie, and honestly, this is like my ideal scenario for these games. One professional player from the male and female leagues respectively, and the rest of the cast are solely original characters. That way, there still is some representation of the big leagues, but they aren't stealing the spotlight from the regular kids. Honestly though, the formula for backyard sports games has become pretty set in stone by this point. Seasonal play is the main draw, with the player having the ability to draft their own team, create a name and uniform design, which for the first time is actually shown on an inflated character model from in-game to show it off, which is a cool feature because 3D graphics were a big spectacle all the way back in 2001 and Humongous wanted to show off that they could do them wherever possible, it seems. Custom characters are also a thing in this game that technically started in Baseball 2001 one, but this game allows you to have multiple original player characters, so I figured this is probably a good enough time to talk about it. Basically, if you want to use a personalized custom character, the game will randomize a design for you and give you a pool of stat points that you can distribute as you see fit. If you want a character who's great at shooting, you can max that stat out with ease at the cost of having lower stat distribution in the other fields. This feature gives the player a lot of options when it comes to designing a team, and having at least one custom character on your side might not necessarily be a bad idea. It could really save a team that has four great players but just can't seem to find the right fit for that fifth spot. Character customization is a common feature that will be appearing in future titles, but I won't really be going over it in every single game because a lot of them feel the same exact way, and it would just be redundant, kind of like the roster changes. As such, it is safe to assume that most of these games I'll be talking about has some level of character customization, but of course it can vary from game to game. This is Sunny Day, along with the legend in his own mind, Barry DeJ. Barry DeJ is in the hues. I got two words for the teams on the court today, Sonny. Shoot the ball! You can't score if you don't shoot. And if I had to sit through one of these low-scoring defensive struggles, I might do something drastic. You know, like start doing my homework or something. Well put, Barry.
Backyard Basketball 2001 honestly plays very similar to Backyard Soccer if I had to make a comparison. You control the players with your mouse as you guide them up and down the court and can pass to teammates to try and score a basket on the opposing team. Shooting in this game is performed simply by hovering the mouse over the basket and timing the shot whenever the black circle around the ball icon lines up perfectly. The closer you time your click, the more likely it is to go in. Which team am I on? Of course, you can also block opponent's shots by hovering the mouse over the basket while on defense as well. Games are also co-commentated by Sunny Day, as usual, and her basketball expert assistant this time around, Barry DeJ, who knows a thing or two about shooting hoops. He's a pretty cool co-host, and I can certainly enjoy him more than Vinny and Chuck Downfield, that's for sure. Honestly though, the game is extremely simplistic when it gets down to it, so these aren't hard mechanics to get used to, but honestly, it works. I don't really have too many complaints about about the way this one plays, most likely because of how similarly it plays to soccer, which I really enjoyed despite not liking the sport in real life. It seems basketball is the same way for me because once again the sport that I didn't enjoy playing as a kid has a video game variant that I enjoy more than the sports that I did like playing. Oh the irony. Also, I guess I can mention that the game has a pretty sizable court selection with a mix of indoor courts and outdoor courts which really keeps things fresh and exciting, but hey, other than that I don't have too much else to say about the first backyard basketball game. It's fun, and it works. Not really much else I could ask for if I'm being honest. I'm Sunny Day. Alongside me today is a man who proves that size doesn't matter much. Barry DJ. Here I am. I am here. <laughs> you know it, it, you know. Let's light this candle. Booyah! Well put, Barry. Now get ready for me to start grouping a bunch of these games together, because if I didn't, this video would have like 50 different sections to it, and that's just too overwhelming for me to structure a project like this, plus it's already as long as it is, so in cases like these where a game was released under the same or similar names on multiple consoles, then I will be lumping them together. In this case, it's Backyard Baseball 2003, released for both PC and Game Boy Advance. The Game Boy Advance version is the less complicated version of the two, because it is more or less just a handheld translation of Backyard Baseball 2001 with an updated roster of MLB players. Otherwise, it honestly just feels like a translation of the previous title to the Game Boy Advance complete with sprite animations and digitized backgrounds of the same fields that had originally existed. It doesn't do anything exciting to really expand on the series, and given that the game is limited to just six buttons and a D-pad, Game Brains had to take some liberties in order to make do. Oh, I forgot to mention that again. This game was not developed by Humongous Entertainment at all. It was actually a project Infogrames had assigned to a completely different studio while Humongous was working on the GameCube version of the game. As such, I will be mentioning who's developing each game if it's not by Humongous themselves going forwards because from here on out Humongous won't be the only devs creating the Backyard Sports games. I don't know that I can necessarily say this one was created by Game Brains though because seeing as like I said, it's more so a direct translation of 2001 onto the Game Boy Advance. Thankfully though, it's nowhere near as bad as the PS1 port of Backyard Soccer. MLS edition. But anyways, back to the simplification of the gameplay. Due to the inability to really control where a player needs to click in the strike zone to bat, the game has to resort to the simple press A at the correct time method in order to accommodate, which means that hitting at the plate just got exponentially easier. Now it's as simple as timing the swing without even having to pay attention to where the ball is going to pass through.
You'll remember I complimented the original game for having this mechanic in order to set itself apart from other console baseball games, so the removal of this feature just feels like a step backwards, but at the same time I understand why it was done because of the hardware limitations, so I don't really fault the game for this. The handheld version has the typical modes of seasonal play, quick games, home run derby, t-ball, etc., and the character roster is pretty much the same, so there's not much more to be said beyond that. I'll just establish this now that going forward as we get into more and more of these repeat sports games, I'm going to have less to say because I just don't want to repeat what I've already said about the previous entries, so from this point forward I will only mostly be acknowledging major differences as I see them, otherwise it's safe to assume that all of the other features remain relatively the same from game to game. Now the PC version of Backyard Baseball 2003 on the other hand, well, it's just an updated version of 2001 which was already an updated version of 1997. In other words, there's hardly anything new here worth talking about aside from an updated player roster consisting of a few new athletes and some stat tweaks which aren't worth getting into. A slightly updated user interface in certain areas compared to before, hmm, what else? The online feature was removed from this version of the game and instead a batting practice shortcut was added to the center of the menu which was convenient I suppose. Having a batting practice feature which was also available in the 2001 version is nice for helping players who are still accommodating to the controls but it's nothing new. The game also added four new fields in the form of the Paveway, Casa de Pablo, Scrapco Field, and Dubois Diamond. But despite it being nice to see some fresh environments here, I really don't think that that and an updated roster are enough to justify a total re-release. Unfortunately, that's the nature of sports games when it gets down to it. Every year it's the same game with maybe one new feature added, one other feature removed, and an updated player roster. And even then, the updated roster doesn't make any sense in context to backyard sports because these only feature like one player per sports team. There are no preset teams, it's not like the entirety of the MLB was featured here. Some team players remain the same from 2001, like Randy Johnson for the Arizona Diamondbacks, but then other teams had a new player introduced, such as Jimmy Rollins, replaced and Kurt Schilling for the Phillies. Oh, the time of day was changed to show a sunset out of the window instead of broad daylight. That's something, right? Eh? No? Yeah, not really. Uh, yep, this version feels way less justified than 2001 did, seeing as it adds almost nothing new and hardly tweaked the gameplay at all. I guess some of the voice actors were changed, that's worth noting, such as Lonnie Manella replacing Jen Taylor as Sunny Day. Um, there are also other recognizable names here, like Corey and Connor Bringus playing some of the kids, William Corkery, Ryan Drummond. Hey, wait a minute. Yeah, we'll see about that, that, that no girl. food or movies. I'm out of here. If I tell you, I will you marry it. me? Faker. No way. Faker. I thought I had I think you are the fake so hedgehog around here. the show on the road. Hey, where are you going? I what? What you see is what Revenge. you Just to die. Love revenge. Say You're enough. not even good enough to be my hedgehog. I'll make you eat those words. Close up. Let's get to work. What the heck is the Sonic Adventure 2 voice cast doing here? Okay, weird, but okay, sure, so I guess that's something cool. Backyard Baseball 2003 is voiced by the Sonic Adventure 2 voice cast. At least seeing Backyard Baseball in the GBA, mostly intact no less, was a novel thing to see in this section, but Backyard Baseball 2003 as a whole? Well, I guess in retrospect it's probably better to play this than 2001 because it has more content, but back in the day when it was released I would have just said keep playing 2001 because it's the same game with very minor changes. Really it is just a matter of perspective. Don't have much more to add on this one though, that's about it. Hopefully by now you're starting to notice the pattern here. Since Backyard Baseball 2003 was released the prior year, it was Backyard Football's turn in the rotation once again to receive the exact same treatment as Backyard Baseball. A dual release both on the Game Boy Advance and, not PC this time, but the Nintendo GameCube surprisingly enough. 
All right, our first ever real backyard sports game developed for a home console. That should be interesting. And so begins the second era of backyard sports, an era that I like to call the Neo Sports era. Why is that? Because the next era of games that I'm going to be talking about all share the same general aesthetic, which looks like an early 2000s new look for backyard sports. I realize that in retrospect, it's not really new anymore because this is only the second era of the franchise, but I just like the term and it's the most fitting thing I could think of to fully encapsulate all of the games from like 2002 to 2006. I probably should have established this earlier, but I have personally taken the liberty to break the entire franchise of backyard sports down down into four major eras, the Classic Era, the Neo Sports Era, the Dark Era, and the Identity Crisis Era. These are not official eras named by the people who own Backyard Sports, these are completely made up by me for myself to organize this video, so whether or not you also refer to them as such is completely up to you. I don't see anybody in the Backyard Sports fandom referring to these games in eras, so I don't really think there is an official general consensus that everyone agrees upon, but hey, if I can offer that, then let's go with it. So, let's address the handheld version of Backyard Football 2003 first, as I think this will be a quick one to get over with. If you ever wanted backyard football on a handheld device, well, this is it. Just as Backyard Baseball remained faithful to its previous entries, Backyard Football 2004 on the GBA does the exact same thing. This time around, the game was developed by Taurus Games, who were taking their first crack at the Backyard Sports series. Considering this is a Backyard Football title, I'm sure you already know how I feel about this game. Wow, that was the very first play I made when I turned on this game. And in the trash it goes. Same top-down horizontal gameplay, same crummy AI. I don't know what it is, I have no trouble playing actual Madden games all the time. Heck, I literally had Madden NFL 2002 on the Game Boy Advance, and I would always dominate in that game. But when it comes to backyard sports, it just doesn't click with me. I mean, I clearly threw a direct pass straight to my receiver there, and he just didn't feel like catching it. Don't know why. He was clearly capable, he just didn't. Didn't feel like it. I think that the game does a fine job of replacing the point-and-click mouse gameplay with a button mapping. Honestly, I think it's a bit easier to determine who to throw it to and the screen is tinier so your eyes don't have to move as far to see who's open. I also like that I don't have to worry about only being able to click so far on the edge of the screen because I can rely on a button press in case the player ever does make it past the boundary. But even still, I'd rather let this next clip explain my thoughts on how reliable I find the passing in this game to be. Three perfect passes to my teammates on the same drive who just didn't feel like catching the ball. Meanwhile, the AI never made a single incomplete pass in either of the two games I ended up recording footage of. Oh, and how about that time where the opponent was able to run through four of my team members without getting tackled once? I get if I didn't press the tackle button correctly as one of them, but the computer controlling the rest of my side should have easily made that happen with the other three. Hey, Backyard Football 2003 on the Game Boy Advance, do you mind throwing me a bone and actually being good? No, I don't really feel like it. Credit where credit is due, I think the game sprites of Sunny Day and Chuck Downfield look really great and translated well to the Game Boy Advance. And the devs actually bothered to implement the weather system from the PC version so that some fields can actually have rain, which is also reflected in the sports commentator cutscenes. How the rain works gameplay-wise, however, well... Riveting. Better in presentation than execution, that feature. Oh, there are power-ups in this game, by the way. There have been in every Backyard Sports game. Overall, I mean, it's Backyard Football on a handheld, so in that sense it's a success, but I don't know, man. 
I think this might be the worst one yet. I still haven't found a backyard football game that actually works for me. I'm writing each of these game entries in the order I play them as I said at the start of the video, so I haven't experienced the next game I'm about to talk to yet at the time I write these words, but hopefully I can find one that I genuinely find to be well programmed, because I really do want to enjoy one of these football games the way that I do baseball and soccer. Can the GameCube version of backyard football be that saving grace I so desperately need? Well, 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 what do we have here? Is this the first ever Backyard Sports console game that isn't a port? Why, indeed it is! Backyard Football for the Nintendo GameCube, originally developed by Left Field Productions and Humongous Entertainment as a joint project. The console version of this title is almost nothing like the handheld version. It's got better graphics and a 3D playstyle implemented rather than the top-down side view that the Game Boy version had that already makes this immensely better than all the previous football games. Same looking user interface, same roster, same sport. But hey, I have quite a few things to compliment here. The variety in stadiums is actually a huge breath of fresh air seeing as there's a lot of diverse environments to choose from, and the game actually expanded on the weather system of the handheld version by including not only a sunny and rainy setting, but a snowy weather and nighttime mode as well, which really adds to the diversity of the fields that can be played on in this game. Yeah, we've got returning areas like the Dimitri Dome and Sandy Flats, which are cool to see adapted from the original PC environments to this full-on 3D area, but there are also some new fields too, such as Cactus Gulch and Rocky Vista, the latter of which actually has a holiday theme specifically for that field in case you're ever playing this game during Christmas time, which coincidentally, I was when I recorded this footage. Most of the kids translated to 3D decently well and all of the stapled characters are here, Ahmed Khan, Stephanie Morgan, Dmitry Petrovitz, and the secret weapon as well. I'm not really going to be going over more specific changes to a roster from here on out, such as logging every single time a kid gets dropped or explaining which pros were cut and which ones were added. I'm not acknowledging every single roster change for every single game because that just doesn't strike me as something super necessary to the video, and I highly doubt most people care. I guess I'll at least acknowledge that Sunny Day and Chuck Downfield are still the hosts of this game and have their usual interspliced moments during it, although their commentary isn't nearly as frequent as in past titles. In fact, the chatter problem that I had in Backyard Baseball games has actually worked its way in here too, because now, for one reason or another, none of these kids will ever shut up. I will say though, that for the very first time, I finally found a backyard football game that works for me. Now don't get me wrong, there's still some ridiculously stupid AI shenanigans going on here and there. But aside from that, the actual process of passing the ball is way more reliable in a 3D space because I can actually see where all of my players are at any given time. I can move my quarterback to the side of a field and toss the ball to a player with ease because I can usually tell if a defender will get in the way or if they're open. Most of the plays usually work and the players do as I expect of them whether on offense or defense. My defensive line actually defended when the opponent was trying to score, believe it or not, crazy I know. And I never felt like there were any turnovers that were completely out of my control. I genuinely had a good time playing this one. Sure, it's not amazing and you can tell it's a low budget GameCube game, but for what it is, it works a lot better than all of the previous football games did. This one also supports multiplayer with a friend, so if you ever feel like playing backyard football against a human opponent, knock yourself out. I think there's some fun to be had there. The power-ups actually work here too, believe it or not, so that also adds a bit of spice into the mix during the game, and the sonic boom isn't completely broken. How about that? I would never consider this as a must-play title on the GameCube or anything, but as the first Backyard Sports title developed specifically for a home console, it gets a lot of things right and is a good start for all of the other games to come. Undoubtedly the best Backyard Football game thus far, if you were to ask me. Gameplay-wise at least, maybe not in terms of presentation, but I had fun with this one, surprisingly enough, so hey, I guess I can finally say that the streak of not fun football games has finally come to an end.
While Humongous was being made to essentially continue recreating the same couple of games over and over and over again as dictated by their evil corporate overlords, they were still given a few opportunities to expand their reach by creating backyard sports games for new sports as well. Backyard Basketball was the first new sports game amidst this sea of mostly baseball, soccer, and football, and now hockey was getting thrown into the mix too. I will say, hockey is a sport that I'm not really all that into, but I like it more than soccer and basketball. I've got enough of a sense for how the sport works, but I don't really go out of my way to watch it even on an irregular basis. Still, Backyard Hockey makes perfect sense as an addition to the franchise and releasing it in October was perfect timing back then in anticipation for that year's upcoming season. It's got the standard formula you'd expect from a Backyard sports game by this point. It's a mishmash of original characters combined with some NHL All-Stars at the time and features all of the iconic teams in the league. Once again, the same aesthetic is used for the menu screen to indicate that, yes, we are fully committed to the Neo Sports era here. Personally speaking, I'm not really a fan of this design. Sure, it's functional, but it's also incredibly boring compared to the treehouse menu screen. Backyard Hockey 2003 could have continued the trend of using the treehouse menu screen, or heck, even use a brand new setting as the main menu that displayed all of the options because, admittedly, the treehouse environment was getting recycled over and over again, most likely to cut costs, and was getting rather uninspired to look at by this point. But a new menu in a similar style using, oh, I don't know, maybe a locker room setting? would have been a perfect substitute to mix things up. Nah, instead it's just the generic menu and as you'll quickly begin to notice with the game's animations, as little of it as there is, this game most likely wasn't given very much of a budget because the parent company hardly even bothered to support Humongous' endeavors. There are still modes for things like quick games and seasonal play and you can view all of the player stats like before, it's just in a very bland text menu rather than the fun environment presentation. I think Backyard Hockey is a case where the dev team did the best they could with what they had because functionally it plays like a backyard sports hockey game. The game is played as a 4 on 4 rather than a 6 on 6 hockey match where each team has 3 players and a goalie. In order to score you just need to shoot the puck into the opposing team's net, which at first is easier said than done but you can quickly get the hang of things as you play the game more. Backyard Hockey 2003 uses both mouse buttons to play the game rather than placing each command all on one, so in order to play the game you'd use the cursor to point your player in the direction you want them to move, left click to pass to a teammate and right click to either shoot the puck or attempt to steal it from an opponent. Simple as that, it's a very straightforward game, although admittedly the arenas feel a bit too small compared to the players, especially when playing in a 4-3 aspect ratio, and the engine is pretty fast paced because it feels like the characters are skating around at the speed of sound with how fast the screen moves. Still, it's one of those things that I got the hang of and I'm actually able to control my character unlike most backyard football titles, so I find this one easier to jump into and play. Unfortunately, unlike previous games where there would be cool full screen animations for athletes whenever they'd get up to bat or score a touchdown, here it's limited to this small section of the menu screen which is a little underwhelming, but at least each character has their own animation for whenever they score a goal. Here they come! She <laughs> This one's too close for my blood, I tell ya! The game has a decent selection of arenas to choose from, but I kinda wish there was a bit more diversity in their appearances because a lot of them don't look too different from one another. And it's also difficult to really tell which player is which kid, like in backyard football, because their helmets sorta obscure them from view. Of course, that's the nature of the sport because hockey can get pretty physical sometimes, and I'm sure Humongous didn't want to promote kids playing the sport dangerously without the proper safety gear, so it makes sense, and I kinda like the fact that the actual fighting in hockey has been replaced by rock, paper, scissors. That's actually pretty amusing. Today, we're at Ducks on a Pond. <laughs> Ducks on a Pond, get it? <laughs> okay, anyway. Also, Sunny Day returns to announce as always, and joining her this time around is newcomer Buddy Check, because it just sorta of became a trend that there'd be a different co-commentator depending on the sport. I honestly wonder who it was that made that decision. Backyard Hockey also saw a later release on the Game Boy Advance that is similar to the GBA baseball and football variants of handheld backyard sports that I have already discussed. That said, of course, this is literally just a translation of the PC version of the game compressed down into a cartridge meant to be played on the go. The character models have been replaced 
replaced with 2D sprites, but otherwise it still functions as the console game did. It is a top-down perspective as players travel vertically up and down the ring to try and shoot the opponents on goal, and the control scheme is pretty straightforward with A being the slap shot button while B passes to other teammates. Honestly, beyond that, what else can I say? It's backyard hockey just like the PC version, but on the Game Boy Advance. Enough said. At the end of the day, Backyard Hockey definitely has some rough patches in the game's overall presentation and graphics, but functionally, it's a playable hockey game. If you like hockey, and you like backyard sports, you'll probably enjoy this game for what it is, but it's not a technical marvel by any stretch of the imagination, and you can definitely tell the animation budget feels a lot cheaper here than in previous games. Just based on the footage I've shown on screen of this and the last several titles in the Neo Sports era, it should be getting more and more apparent how the Backyard Sports franchise was becoming less of a passion project by a group of genuine developers and more of a standard gotta meet the early release quota to make a bunch of money franchise. I don't have the accurate sales figures for every individual backyard sports title to really give a clear idea of how well they each performed, although I really wish I did because I'd be curious to know which of these performed the best and what was the worst selling, but at this point in time the franchise was still going strong releasing several games a year as Humongous Entertainment's only game series that they were developing for, gone were the point and click adventure games, gone were the junior arcade titles, and with Moonbase Commander bombing in sales the previous year thanks to the higher up executives putting the game through extreme obstacles just to not add advertise or support it upon release, and then blame the game for selling poorly, well, it was pretty much set in stone that Humongous was only going to be releasing Backyard Sports titles from this point on. Thus, their fate was sealed. Backyard Hockey wouldn't be the last original Backyard Sports title by the company, however, but the humble little developer's demise was rapidly approaching. The Frostbiters just have to hit a three-point goal here, and they'll be right back in it. Too bad there's no such thing. <laughs> Alright, considering that we've been over this song and dance twice before, I'm just gonna keep this brief. Remember every change I pointed out for Backyard Baseball 2003? Yeah, take the exact same changes and apply them to Backyard Soccer, and that's Backyard Soccer 2004 in a nutshell. The game keeps the exact same gameplay as before with an updated character roster including some new soccer players and stat adjustments. Four new playing fields including Kamehameha Cove, Adobe Flats, Crane Construction, and a farm with a name that, similar to Vinny, was chosen prior prior to the internet coining a term for it that leads to some very unfortunate implications. Good thing Soccer 2004 tends to be overlooked. A penalty kick practice mode shortcut is available right on the main hub screen where you can take shots at Mr. Clanky, so that's fun I guess, it replaces the batting practice mode from Baseball 2003, and the background behind Sunny Day and Earl Grey changes depending on what field you're playing on now. The voices of this game have also been changed to the Sonic Adventure 2 voice cast, but I figured that was already assumed since, you know, this is by the same team that did Baseball 2003. Otherwise, it's the exact same game as Backyard Soccer MLS Edition, so while I'd argue this is the definitive version of Backyard Soccer, play because it has the most content nowadays, it wasn't much of a justified release back in the day. Here's a shot! And, and he scores! scores! I'm not sure I can believe my own eyes! I guess for what it's worth, this was the last ever Backyard Soccer title to release, as well as the final Humongous Entertainment game to ever be made with the Scum engine, so we've already reached the end of the line for one of the three original sports. Won't matter much for the other two because we still have plenty of games to get through regarding those, but we're already at a milestone. Crazy to think. Even still, Backyard Soccer, despite me getting no enjoyment out of the real life sport, is the one I have the most nostalgic attachment to and is the game I enjoy the most out of the original trilogy, so I'll still vouch for it at the end of the day even if it was overshadowed by its baseball and football siblings. But I suppose this marks the official end of the classic era. From here on out, it's strictly Neo Sports and onwards. Takes one! I'm getting hungry! <laughs> Finally break the stalemate!
Backyard Football wasn't the only sports game to make its way onto the Nintendo GameCube. Lo and behold, baseball was right there after it just one year later in 2003. Backyard Baseball 2004 is pretty much exactly what you would expect as the baseball equivalent to the GameCube version of football. Similar menu UI, same character models, and it's just a 3D translation of the games from the prior PC versions. Players can still choose their pitch types based on the four face buttons available when fielding, and choose their swings when batting. Similar roster as before with a few players added and removed for the New Year's season, and lots of new fields to choose from between the Boardwalk, Gator Flats, which is kind of like a swampy area, the desert buttes. I really dig the field diversity here. In fact, there isn't a single repeated field location from Backyard Football 2004. Every single one of these is brand new, made specifically for this game, with the exception of Steel Stadium from the OG Backyard Baseball game. Hiya, folks! It's another great day for baseball. We're at the beautiful boardwalk today. Overall, I think the general sense of control present here with Backyard Baseball 2004 is pretty good. I never felt like I was unfairly restricted from being able to control how my players swing, pitch, or run. Yes, there is still the random chance of errors occurring when players try to catch the ball, but I found it to be a bit more infrequent compared to past titles, so I consider that a good thing. This game was also the first to introduce the ability for base runners to lead off and pitchers to attempt to pick them off, which, while it might be a minor addition, it does show show that the team working on this title was aiming to expand on the gameplay wherever possible. And honestly, I can tell that Backyard Baseball 2004 has more effort put into it than most of the other Neo sports games thus far, just based on all of the new content that was featured here, although this is more prevalent in the PS2 and PC versions of the game. The GameCube version of Backyard Baseball 2004 was actually released one year prior to those titles, which is why I'm covering it first. But just know that all of the versions covered in this section are are fundamentally the same game. Think of this like the GameCube version of Sonic Mega Collection, and then the PS2 version was later called Mega Collection Plus and featured some extra content on top of what was in the GameCube version. It's the same exact situation here. Whoever said two wrongs don't make a right has never seen this kid banging dingers. I don't think that was coming back. I should mention that the official title for this game is just Backyard Baseball, but considering the fact that I don't want to just repeat names and have things get confusing, I'm going to continue to put the year after the name of each title in the situations where a game was not given one. Hence, Backyard Baseball 2004. There is one thing I noticed while playing that I did find a little bit weird though. Usually when I would record footage for these games, I've been choosing the quick play option so I can just get right into a match without doing all of the roster setup through the seasonal leagues. However, with this game in particular, I noticed that I kept getting the same players on my team roster every single time. Pablo Sanchez, Barry Bonds, Derek Jeter, Vicky Kawaguchi, Ichiro. It was always those same players at the start of my batting lineup with maybe a slight change here and there. Settling into the box is Pablo Sanchez. Settling into the box is Pablo Sanchez. Settling into the box is Pablo Sanchez. Stepping up to the plate, Pablo Sanchez. Settling into the box is Pablo Sanchez. Maybe the game is programmed to roll a set roster for the player via quick play and the only time it varies is if the computer chooses one of the players that that player is meant to have? I'm not sure, but it was weird how often I'd get the same team considering I did like five or six pickup games for this segment's footage. A home run derby mode also exists as with prior modes and oh my god Mr. Clanky really let himself go. What's weird about this derby mode though is that it rotates between three players each having three swings at pitches per round rather than having everyone go through through as many pitches as possible until they get a certain number of outs. Kinda weird that it was done this way, I didn't find it very fun as a result, and yeah, I'm not really sure what to make of it. I assume this was meant to be a multiplayer thing, but the game is unclear about it, and player one can control all three batters, so I'm not sure if this was unfinished, or if it's just a throwaway feature, or what. My biggest complaint with Baseball 2004 is that the load times are obnoxious, and they occur in between every single half inning. 
Every time you get booted back to the scoreboard, the game has to take several moments loading up the field and players all over again, which is weird because Football 2004 did not have this issue at all, and the PC versions of baseball were instantaneous, which probably has me a little spoiled. All in all, I think Backyard Baseball 2004 is fine. Its most noteworthy trait is being the first 3D Backyard Baseball game, but alas, football already beat it to the punch in being the first 3D game in general, so I've kind of already expressed my interest in that shift during that game. Still, could I recommend it? Yes, but the PS2 and PC versions are better, so definitely hold out for those versions instead. Just a short time later, Humongous Entertainment ended up re-releasing this updated version of Backyard Baseball 2004 as Backyard Baseball 2005, but unlike Backyard Baseball 2003, I can definitely see why a lot of additional content was added to this game to try and justify the re-release more. I wouldn't say this re-release is entirely brand spanking new, but it was released on a different platform with some added features and modes that couldn't have been downloaded as a patch update or DLC back when the game first came out, because this was released before internet connectivity really took off with video game consoles, so I can give it a pass. For starters, Alex Rodriguez was featured on the cover of both games, but had his uniform changed and updated from the Rangers to the Yankees due to the trade that had occurred in between both games. Basically, Backyard Baseball 2005 is the same game as 2004 with a few extra bells and whistles that aren't too hard to notice. A few new fields have been added in the form of a drive-in theater variant, as seen in Backyard Football on the GameCube, and a third unlockable stage as well, and a return Returning feature from the aforementioned 3D Backyard Football title is the option for a day and night mode on a few specific fields. I'm not sure why this wasn't done for every field in the game, but the fact that there's a bit more variety here is still cool nonetheless. Greetings, sports fans! It's another great day for baseball! We're coming to you live from the Starlight Orchards Drive-In Theater, and you're just in time for the game! An additional minigame was also added to the mix so that Home Run Derby wasn't the only option available anymore. In the form of this admittedly lackluster fielding challenge where Mr. Clanky hits the ball and you have to prevent him from scoring, which is hardly any different from a regular game of baseball, but hey, I guess it's difficult to come up with minigames for this particular backyard sports variant. There's also a third unlockable minigame that you can get once you obtain 40 points in the fielder's challenge with a seasonal team. This game is basically just darts with baseball. However, what's really cool is that it actually takes place inside the old backyard sports clubhouse, complete with references to Putt-Putt and Pajama Sam in the background, which was a very very nice callback. Again, another reason I feel like this game had more effort put into it because I don't recall seeing a single other reference to Humongous' other properties in the last several Backyard Sports games. I commented on how I kept rolling similar team rosters during the GameCube portion of this segment, but I'm happy to say that I didn't really notice it this time around in the PS2 version. I mean, maybe it's still the case and I just got lucky or something, but the roster was updated slightly between iterations, which should go without saying at this point in the retrospective. However, one last added feature that I I did want to bring up that I noticed in my experience is that Barry DJ is now available as a playable character in the game, so that provides for some pretty cool crossover between Backyard Sports franchises. You can also unlock Mr. Clanky as a playable character by completing Clanky's coaching box, so that's another really neat optional Backyard Sports character that you can obtain. No Chuck Downfield or Earl Grey or Buddy Check in sight though, and Vinny has been flat out wiped from existence with his replacement taking over in this game. That's right, Vinny has been completely replaced with a new co-commentator named Abner Doubleplay, and I absolutely hate him. There's no love lost between these two teams, Sonny. Let's take a look at the Angels. These guys are looking to have an outstanding year, Sonny. This team's got all the talent in the world, Sonny. Let's see if they can use it. You gotta play every game like it's the World Series, Sonny. 
Hey, Sonny, you think they're gonna play baseball, Sonny? I sure do, Sonny. Boy, Sonny, wouldn't it be great if I said your name, Sonny, at the end of every sentence I say, Sonny? Give me a break, Sonny. Yeah, I'm sure a part of that was just bad luck with the randomness of the audio lines being played, but it's still obnoxious. If I had to guess why this character change was made though, well, just go back to the unpredictably unfortunate naming choice that was given to Vinny back when the first Backyard Baseball was first released. Also, to give credit where credit is due, this is the first game to give its entire character roster all new and original theme songs, which was a much needed update after having to hear the exact same character riffs for Pete Wheeler, Ahmed Khan, and Dmitry Petrovich over and over again in all of the the other backyard sports games prior to this. We've got Ahmed Khan at the plate. On the field, Axeman is usually too busy playing air guitar to pay attention to the game. Stepping up to the plate, Ahmed Khan. Prepare to be rocked! Pablo still has his classic acoustic guitar though. He is the only character whose theme is unchanged because it's just so iconic. But wait, we're still not finished with Backyard Baseball 2005 just yet because not only was it released on the GameCube and PlayStation 2, it also got a PC version. Even though it's just a port of the PS2 version which was an updated port of the GameCube version which was released one year earlier in 2003. Well hey, this wasn't the first time Humongous had just re-released an updated version of a pre-existing game I guess. So what's new with the PC version compared to the PS2? Well as far as I can tell, it's the exact same game. Same intro, same add-in minigame, some unlockables, same everything. The only real difference here is that it has support for play via keyboard and mouse. I will say though, using the PC version as a basis for this, the unlockable fields in this game are actually pretty cool. You've got the quantum field, which is the added one I mentioned, based off of space with a lot of cool elements featured in the outfield. There's the humongous stadium, which is the most official looking baseball stadium out of the entire list and has references to the previous game scattered about. And then there's the aqua dome, which which is kind of like an underwater Atlantean ruins field. Honestly, I didn't have the patience to unlock these myself seeing as two of the three require you to play through the entire season of baseball and make it to the playoffs and win the World Series beyond that, which quite frankly I didn't have time for, so I borrowed footage of these fields from this channel here that I actually can't read or pronounce the name of. And it's a shame that I didn't have the time or patience to unlock these, but you know, I've got like 50 games to play. I would have loved a chance to actually play on the Aquadome field though. That one looked really cool. You can't tell by looking at it. Woo 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 woo! The delivery hit sharply. Oh, That's a solo shot! Oh hey, who's that swimming in the background there? Yep, Freddy and Luther actually appear in the game swimming over the outfield of this stadium, and that's really neat because by this point the Junior Adventure titles had completely ceased production, so I'm happy to see Humongous was referencing its properties several years after they had ended. Okay, now I think we're done with Backyard Baseball 2004 and 5. Oh gosh darn it, okay. Yes, there was also a handheld port of the game that went under the name of Backyard Baseball 2006, even though it was made using the game from 2004 and 2005 as its basis. It was made in conjunction with Mystic Software, just like the previous two handheld titles, and yes, it uses a compressed user interface with the same game modes, roster, and features, so I don't have much to say here. It plays like the previous Neo Sports GBA ports do, only for baseball instead of hockey or football. I'm not sure what else there really is to say with this one that hasn't already been said by the 3D version or other handheld games, but at least it's not copy and pasted from the 2003 game. There's a completely different user interface both in the menus and during gameplay, and most of the sprite work seems completely new as well. It's fine, but honestly, I prefer the 3D version, and more specifically, the PS2 slash PC version. Huh, <sighs> is that it? Have I finally covered every version of Backyard Baseball 2004 slash 2005 slash 2006? Silence? Okay, I think we're good to finally move on then.
Back to tossing around the old pigskin, it seems, as we're now diving into the 2004 version of Backyard Football, running on the same engine as the recently covered Backyard Hockey, which was released the previous year. This time around, the Backyard Kids retain their new looks from hockey for the most part, which is something I'm not entirely thrilled about. I didn't mention this in the Backyard Hockey section like I probably should have, but I dislike the way the characters look flatter due to their lack of shading and the more washed color choices here. It's just far less visually appealing than the bright ironically more detailed version of the kids that were created over five years before this game was even made. Maybe this was intentional, maybe it was a cry for help from the humongous staff members that Atari was holding them hostage and forcing them to make these soulish cash grab backyard sports games. Honestly, it wouldn't surprise me given the circumstances. The new user interface is less inspired and also ripped directly from backyard hockey with some football edits made to it here and there. Again, I think the menu is fine and functional, but it's plain and generic and lacks the visual personality personality of the first several games that use the treehouse room as its main menu navigation. This is like boring, kid-oriented Madden or something, it's just not that great. But at least Sunny Day and Chuck Downfield return as the co-commentators of this game once again. First and goal, Orange. one yard line, Stay. drops back. Throws a picky Kawaguchi, pulls it in. That one rattled my grinders. Thanks Chuck, I didn't need to know that. And hey, if I can throw in a nice detail out there, it's cool that their outfits actually changed to reflect the weather conditions of the current game. Because yes, the rain, snow, and shine feature returns here from the 2003 GameCube version. Also pulling from past titles, some of the fields from the GameCube version actually made their way in here, believe it or not. Such as the Cactus Gulch setting for instance, so that's kinda cool. And there is a connection there despite these games being released on completely separate platforms. There are also a few new fields here as well, which make it way more distinguisher from the same looking hockey rinks than backyard hockey, such as the airport setting and drive-in setting. I like these ideas, they actually feel right at home with the rest of the game, and it's a missed opportunity that Buzzy the Knowledge Bug doesn't show up at some point in the background of the airport. The game does at least have some kids show up in the background so it doesn't feel totally empty, but honestly they just look creepy more than anything else. Second down and goal, three yard line, looking to throw. Gameplay-wise, I'd also say this game plays about the same as the other top-down titles. The character models are bigger on screen thanks to the zoomed-in camera, so that at least helps me get a better idea of where everyone is, but I don't know, man, I'm still convinced the computer cheats in this game. Before we get underway, I'd just like to remind everyone that this portion of today's game is sponsored by Wilbur's Watch Shop. If you don't know what time it is, it's time to stop by. That is a free ball. I mean, really? What the heck? It's still a bit difficult for me to tell when players overlap each other, making interceptions very likely whenever I go for a passing play, but at the very least I can say that it's better. The core gameplay elements of previous football entries are still here. You choose a play you want to make for each down, and you see it through using the mouse to pass, run, spin, or tackle, depending on if you're currently on offense or defense. Power-ups are still very much a thing, and there are a few new ones featured in this title that weren't in previous games. Although personally speaking, Cough Drop just seems broken because forcing the quarterback back into an automatic fumble is just straight up unfair. Like that's a near guaranteed turnover that the other team just barely has any chance of preventing. First and 20, 25 yard line, looking to throw. Going to the air, Marvin Harrison holds on to it. I see oh, it's over the line. Oh, oh, right on the right on with the game today. The audio issues though. Oh boy, and I thought the chatter in the GameCube version of Backyard Football was annoying. Hmm, yeah, you know, that was really bad. Bad. Was and then I said, oatmeal, are you crazy? Yeah, no, honestly, I have no idea how this was deemed acceptable sound mixing. Aside from that being probably the most glaring issue, this is probably my preferred version of PC Backyard Football games, but I still won't be going out of my way to play this on my own time. It's still Backyard Football, with slightly less impressive hand-drawn animation, but a better camera and field selection. Don't really know what more there is to say beyond that. It's fine. This is Sunny Day along with the BFL's all-time leader in career-threatening injuries, Chuck Downfield. What? Oh, sorry, Sunny. I, I wasn't paying any attention. You are stupid. You are stupid. And don't forget, you are stupid. <laughs>
Now as for Backyard Basketball 2004, well, yeah, it's basically the exact same handful of updates that Backyard Football 2004 got, but applied to the sport of basketball instead. Same user interface, same animation and character designs with an updated roster for the year this game came out, a zoomed in camera on the court, Yep, not much to really go over here. Barry DJ returns for Backyard Basketball 2004, and the different courts available are pretty diverse with both indoor and outdoor options. Although I will say that the biggest change from the previous Backyard Basketball game is that the shooting mechanics have updated a little bit. Now, instead of needing to click on the actual basket to take a shot, your accuracy is based on the power with which you take the shot. Ergo, when you go to shoot the ball, this meter below the character will appear underneath them. And the closer you time your shot to the maximum red setting, the more likely and accurate your shot will be for going in. This in turn actually made the game remarkably easier for me to the point where it felt outright broken because I was nailing three pointers left and right like it was nobody's business when really these shots should not have been as easy to make as they were. I mean seriously, I crushed the computer by over 100 points in the full game I played. It was a total massacre. Stealing and blocking while on defense is pretty easy to pull off too just by right clicking at the appropriate time, so no more needing to hover the mouse over the basket to block shots. Shots. You just need to click properly to pull it off, which in a sense is disappointing because again, it makes the game feel way easier. One thing worth mentioning, and this is true for Hockey, Football 04, and Basketball 04, is that the custom teams are in the game, but they're hidden away in a more obscure location so that the official league teams take precedence. When scrolling through the list of playable options, you'll probably notice there are no choices for things like the Rockets or the Melonheads. It's just official NBA teams only. In order to access these custom teams, you actually need to click this create a custom team button down below and then you'll be able to choose from a selection of original teams. And that's just a shame to me that this would be hidden away like this. In the first editions of these games that featured the official National League teams, both were listed together as if they had the same priority, they were on the same level. Now here the custom teams are just tucked away out of sight so that the player has to go out of their way to pick them, which is just another detail that gives me the feeling these games had become soulless corpses. They were prioritized the professional teams because they promoted the game more. Whether or not that was Humongous's decision, Atari's decision, or the actual sports league's decision, I'm not entirely sure, but somebody definitely made it a point to put the professionals first. And it's a shame too because there's a lot of fun and creative teams that the Humongous team had come up with. I haven't really been acknowledging this, but the fact of the matter is is that every sports game after the original trilogy has mostly come up with some fresh and new ideas for sports teams, with different mascots and color schemes that hadn't been seen in prior games. This is another feature that I don't really feel is necessary to acknowledge in every new sport that I talk about, but let it be known that yes, there are some teams here that aren't seen in previous Backyard Sports titles. But that's the way it goes, I suppose. I don't have too many complaints with Basketball 2004 other than the fact that the intro looks like utter garbage with the way these characters just slapped on top of this background without any rhyme or reason. Seriously, it's just ugly how these characters juxtapose the layer behind them. The game plays fine, but it's very similar to football and hockey, so I've already discussed a lot of the characteristics to those games that also apply here. I guess if I could sum up Backyard Basketball 2004 in one statement, I'd say this. It's fine, but it's way too easy. But before I go on to the next section, I also need to mention that Backyard Basketball 2004 also got a console release exclusively on the PlayStation 2 that is near identical to the PC version except with better graphics and less anti-aliasing on the 3D models, a complete lack of hand-drawn animation in exchange for 3D models, and extra mini-games in the form of Horse and Hot Shot. Oh, and also, of course, a control scheme designed for a controller rather than a keyboard or mouse. X to pass, square to shoot, circle to spin, and triangle to jump or block. Power-ups can be used with the shoulder buttons, and overall I'd say this scheme works and feels pretty good. The timing mechanic on your shots is still present in the game, although instead of paying attention to the power meter at the feet of the players, it is instead replaced by timing this ring above the hoop properly. He tries for three! I get we hit the one minute mark in the 
The closer it is to being in the basket, along with a particular player's stats, ultimately determine the odds of going in. However, this in turn makes three-pointers even more busted when you pick characters with high outside shooting stats. I mean, I figured out the most effective strategy to utterly break this version of the game. All you gotta do is pass the ball to the player closest to the camera on the bottom half of the court, run roughly to this spot behind the three-point line on either side, and take the shot. You're practically guaranteed to make it like 90% of the time and rack up that score, and the computer is not going to try and stop you. This isn't a revolutionary basketball video game or anything, but in terms of how it plays, I do kind of prefer it to the PC version in all honesty, even with that broken mechanic. It looks better, runs better, and has more unlockable extras to boot. If anything, it feels like the PC version is the afterthought and the console version is the definitive edition. I don't know which one Atari was prioritizing at this time, but Humongous developed both versions, so it's anybody's guess, really. Either way, I enjoyed Backyard Basketball 2004 surprisingly more than I expected to, so hey, consider me pleasantly surprised. Low expectations paid off with this one, it seems. And just as Backyard Baseball had multiple releases of the same game, Backyard Basketball was also released on the Game Boy Advance on top of having been released on PC and PS2 as well. No GameCube version though, oddly enough, but this here is, like the football, hockey, and baseball titles that came before it, a direct translation of its bigger variation. The characters are pixelated sprites instead of 3D models, but otherwise it plays the same way, following the logic of the PC version with the power meter below the characters rather than the ring above the hoop method that was featured in the console version. This game does not feature Around the World as a minigame, but it does at least have the hot shot mode, although I didn't really spend much time on it. The game is fine, timing shots basically just comes down to not letting go of the button too early or too late, and otherwise it's got the same staple power-ups and controls that the backyard games are known for. Simple as that, really. Not much more needs to be said on this one either. All in all, I think all four of these handheld games that I've been talking about are all fine enough as a quick game to take on the go, but I will undoubtedly recommend recommend the PC or console versions of them over the GBA games any day of the week. They're just inferior to their 3D counterparts, unfortunately. At the very least, they work for what they're meant to do, so I can't knock them too much, however. I can't see myself ever going back to them. So, Sonny, uh, how do you feel about short guys? They're okay. I mean, if you're into gnomes and stuff, why do you ask? Uh, no reason. It's tip-off time. Continuing the trend of the Backyard Sports Games getting a 3D version of a previously established sports game comes Backyard Hockey 2005, the second and final hockey video game that Humongous Entertainment ever made. Well, third technically if you count the GBA version of 2003, but honestly though, unlike the 3D baseball equivalent, there isn't a lot of difference here between this and the 2003 version. Now sure, the game is fully 3D, so the 2D animations of the characters during scored goals or Sonny and Buddy Check's commentary are gone, and the 3D models are no longer these compressed variants, but rather in their full resolution. Hi-ho, sports lovers! We're coming to you live and quacking from Ducks on a Pond, where we've got two tough teams going at it, the Vancouver Canucks against the Atlanta Thrashers. I'm Sunny Day. At my side today is the guy who sleeps with his stick, Buddy Check. Hey, folks, I'm Buddy Check. Um, like she said, <laughs> I love this game! You put a number of specialists on the ice and use them strategically, it's like a game of chess! Only the pieces never stop moving around the board, and the knights can bend the stick for nasty slaps at your king! In fact, 
forget the chess. Gameplay wise, it still feels remarkably similar to that of 2003, practically identical. I'm not sure if the team did reuse the same code or if this was rebuilt from the ground up, but it doesn't feel much different than the previous title. It's still a three on three match, plus the goalies on each side, you aim with the mouse or shooter pass with the two click buttons, and a lot of the same stadiums that were in 2003 make a return here, but they look way better than they did before. Welcome to another exciting edition of VHL Hockey. We're bringing you all the action live from the Ice Castle Arcade and Community Center Skate Rink. There's a lot more variety in the arenas of this game, which makes visually distinguishing between each one much, much easier to do. And I quite enjoy a lot of the motifs on top of that. There's an arcade, a motel pool, a pier. These things did not come through in the 2003 version, but in 2005, lots of more interesting locations are prevalent this time around instead of the same arena recolored slightly differently six times over. The game has plenty of unlockables worth going for and the standard features you'd expect being in the 3D era of the backyard sports games now. Honestly though, of all the 3D titles, this one is probably my least favorite because it feels the least expansive on a previous entry. I don't find this to be a particularly bad game, but compared to 3D baseball, 3D basketball, and 3D football, this is not a huge leap in a new direction. Credit where credit is due though, this does have the best minigame out of any backyard sports game. Never mind, I take it all back. 10 out of 10, game of the year. Following the releases of Backyard Basketball 2004 and Backyard Hockey 2005, Humongous Entertainment wanted to branch out a bit more and try something new again, with Backyard Skateboarding being the result. What a breath of fresh air this game is, I tell you. I'm really starting to feel the grind of going through all these different sports games, but man am I dedicated to this project I've given myself. Backyard Skateboarding is easily one of the games I've had the most fun with out of all of these titles so far, and while the Tony Hawk's Pro Skater or Underground comparisons are sure to run rampant for anyone playing this game, I personally don't have that much experience with those skateboarding titles to begin with, so. I can distinctly recall a few times in my my life where I had gone over to a friend's house and they had Tony Hawk's Pro Skater on their PS1 or N64, but the only Tony Hawk game I've ever personally owned in my life is Tony Hawk's Underground 2, which admittedly I did play a lot of. I also purchased the remake of Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 and 2 for the PS5, but I only have a few hours into it, so I've not completed the game at the time of this video. That said, man is it obvious that Backyard Skateboarding took all of its ideas straight from Tony Hawk. Backyard Skateboarding feels like it takes a lot of the similar elements from those games that I mentioned and applies them to a more kid-oriented setting. The game takes place across multiple different stages, each of which are modeled after a particular theme and contain multiple different quest types that the player is able to complete. The most unfortunate aspect of this game is that it will probably take you roughly two hours to beat from start to finish, even less time if you don't go after every single challenge like I did. Length aside though, I honestly had a blast with this game as it is the most refreshing backyard sports game I've played here, period. For starters, Backyard Skateboarding actually has a story to it, marking the first time one of these games has ever had an actual story mode, believe it or not. Yeah, it took us this long to get to a game with a story. I was over at Mom and Pop's skate shop and they told me about this, the Backyard Skate Tour. The basic gist here is that the backyard kids are getting tired of the same old same old and want to all chip in to build a brand new skate park for them to hang around at. Luckily for them, pro skater Andy McDonald shows up in his iconic yellow helmet with a list of several neighborhood kids that would totally be down to help out with the skate park if they can beat their mission at each of the other local skate parks. Thus, from there all the kids set out to get started on building this brand new skate park together. Not really sure how they get all the money to actually 
you know, construct this thing, but hey, details, details. Backyard Skateboarding is a sandbox skateboarding game where you can go around each of the different environments performing tricks, collecting coins, and completing missions to unlock new gear for your skateboarding kid. As with previous Backyard Sports games, you do have the ability to create your own custom character if you want to right from the get-go and gradually build them up over the course of the game. However, you also have the option to pick from one of the default kids on the roster, such as Pablo or Dimitri. Andy Mac is also a playable character and seeing as he is the only celebrity athlete lead in this game, and clearly the character with the best stats, I just went with him because why not? Surprisingly though, not every kid character is available to play as. Kids like Tony Del Vecchio and the Weber Twins solely exist as NPCs in this game, so the full roster of backyard kids is not available here, and some of them have been removed from the game altogether. Other kids like Pete Wheeler and Jacinda Smith are playable, but they are considered locked characters until you defeat their specific boss challenge in their corresponding world. Hey there, I'm pretty fast on this here skateboard. The level variety is pretty nice here, consisting of the neighborhood, boardwalk, rooftops, England land, that one seems kind of out of place, and skate station alpha. Something worth noting is that the rooftops level is an all exclusive level to the game of the year edition. It is not included in the original game. I'm Sunny Day, along with the slightly queasy Eric Stream. I am not digging the heights, Sonny. Every level is also introduced by Sunny Day, so she's still around providing some announcements before each level to get things going, which is cool. And this time around, she's joined by none other than Eric Stream, with a voice that might sound familiar to those that have seen my coverage of the Putt-Putt franchise. I'm Sunny Day. Joining me today is three-time Backyard Skate Tour champ, and two-time Skater Dude Monthly Skater Dude of the Year, Eric Stream. Thanks, Sonny. I'm stoked to be here. Can't wait to see these kids rip it up. Woohoo! Yep, it's the third voice of Putt-Putt back at it again, doing a near identical voice with a slightly more bro undertone to it, and it's still not very good. I'm sorry, it's just not. And having to hear it whenever I do tricks in the game gets insanely obnoxious insanely fast. Oh, he almost had it. Sometimes you gotta just try, try, and try again. And then try some more. 50, 50. That's a solid little combo there. 50, 50. Oh yeah! Ugh, yeah, it's just unbearable. The game follows the same structure for each of its levels, so in truth it is a little repetitive, especially when it comes to the various types of missions there are to complete. Each level, aside from the final area, all contain five rookie missions, five pro missions, and one boss mission that the player needs to complete, with one of the pro missions needing to be beaten in order to unlock the next level, and all four of the boss missions in the game needing to be beaten to unlock the final level three if you're not playing the game of the year edition. Once the final level is unlocked, then beating the final mission of that stage ends the game. So what do these missions consist of exactly? Well, quite frankly, I don't notice any difference in difficulty between the rookie and pro missions, so that's pretty much a non-issue, and the types overlap with each other, so there's virtually no reason why these are classified as two different difficulties, but hey. Mission types usually consist of the following, trick missions, collection missions, score missions, and the occasional one-off. For instance, the very the very first mission in the neighborhood level is nothing more than an ollie tutorial, but then no other mission in the game replicates this. Trick missions usually consist of requiring the player to perform the specified trick listed on screen or performing a manual over a set distance without stopping, while collection missions are usually just asking the player to follow a set path which almost always involves grinding and getting all the items before time runs out. Score missions, which are way less frequent than the other two, just ask the player to beat the score listed on screen and uh... <laughs> funny story about that one. So in the rooftops level, which is the third level of the game, there is this mission that asks you to perform a board slide across these helicopter blades because that's totally safe. Totally. Everyone's scared to get up near the blades, so no one wants to try to do any tricks off the helicopter. Well, gee, I wonder why. Honestly, this mission sucks. I have no idea what I'm doing wrong, but no matter what I press, I just can't seem to get this board slide to take. The game specifically states that I need to press F to pay respects to grind along the blades, but whenever I do that without pressing a direction, I end up doing a 50-50, and whenever I press a direction on top of that, I do something completely different. 50-50! 50-50! 
God, I get it. All right, let me see here. Just adjust that little meter right there and ha, who's laughing now, Eric? Anyways, in my frustration of not being able to figure out how to perform this non-existent board slide maneuver, I decided to mash keys randomly hoping that would work. And this was the result. Shake it off, dude. Shake it off. Sweet. Way to go, kid. Nice. Oh man, you totally Failure is not an option. He almost did. But then he didn't. Oh my god. So then I went to perform the first score challenge I was given after that. Think you can beat my score? Bring it. Yay! Get going. You've got a long way to go to beat my score. Who's going? Who's slide? Now you're getting it. 50 50. Who's going? Who's going? Tail slide. Tail slide. Oh, right showed me. I guess I need more practice. Guys, I don't think the game can handle my extreme gamer skill. The five boss missions are probably the most exciting in the whole game, however. Ricky's kinda sucks seeing as it's just another skills mission, but Pete Wheeler's consists of this exciting race sequence where you race him to the end of the course all around the boardwalk. Reese Worthington's challenge on the rooftops has the player skate over these four antenna poles in an admittedly broken fashion. Almost got him all! Dude, you got one! Wow! You're good! I guess that makes us even Steven, huh? It seems the game really cannot handle my pro strats after all because the camera is completely bonked for this. Also, I suppose I should mention that Reese Worthington is the Game of the Year Edition exclusive skater as well. He was not in the original game. Jacinda Smith's challenge is also pretty cool as it has you ramping up over these edges and grabbing the crystals above the metallic dragon heads. It's pretty similar to Reese Worthington's admittedly, but there is some difficulty change in the sense that you aren't as confined as Reese's and have to grab these specific objects. Objects. It's kind of like a timed boss fight, which was unique and interesting. And then the last level has you doing this grind rail followed by an extreme trick as you launch up over the center of the park, and upon doing so, immediately cuts to black as the game comes to a close. You don't even get to see yourself land. It just hard cut right there. 50, 50. It's weird because this mission is given to you by an old school Andy Mack who's considered a different character from regular Andy Mack for some reason. I I'm not really sure, but what's cool is that the credits theme is actually sung by none other than Ahmed Khan and his rock band. <laughs> Okay, admittedly it's really really bad, but at least the person singing sounds like they're having a blast doing so. I mean, that's gotta count for something, right? The Game of the Year edition is mostly the same game as before, but with the added stage and character as I mentioned, plus a new jet boost power up, new tutorials and cosmetic items, and some bug fixes. Basically, treat it like the other sports re-releases, it's the same game as before, but a little bit better. Not totally justified back when it came out, but nowadays it's definitely the best version to play. Backyard Skateboarding didn't just get released on PC, however. As you should probably expect by this point, there was also an inferior Game Boy Advance version released alongside the 3D title. There isn't too much to say here on this game, however. Like all GBA games that came before it, it is just a translation of the PC version except this time from a top-down perspective rather than a full-on third-person one due to the hardware limitations of the Game Boy Advance. It's fine, not really my cup of tea, and I much prefer the PC version of the game. Still, I'm covering every single backyard sports game ever made, so I had to at least mention it here, but I don't have much of a reason to go more in-depth with it than that. 
Oh, Tony Hawk is in the GBA version for what that's worth, not the PC version though. Ultimately, I really enjoyed backyard skateboarding as a game. Sure, it's pretty basic in some areas and it's not completely bug free, but there's a decent amount of fun to be had with this one, even if the more complicated tricks don't work half the time and I just end up mashing buttons hoping I get it right. I've always enjoyed running around 3D environments like this and the skateboarding movement style definitely has me wanting to re-experience some Tony Hawk games again. Honestly, this is up there is one of my favorite backyard sports games in general. I had a blast with this title and suggest anyone check it out if they're interested. It might partially be because I've grown so numb to the formulaic gameplay of all of these repeated sports games every year, but you know, I'm aware it's not amazing and the Tony Hawk games are probably most definitely better, but hey, my personal enjoyment of this one was way above average, so I really want to stress that point. Either way, when it comes to backyard skateboarding, I'm very satisfied. You know, time was, this town didn't used to have nothing to do for anybody on wheels, like so many towns, but that all changed when you came along. You stepped up, you reached deep down, and you know what? Something happened, because you knew that you have what it takes to do what it takes to skate to the top and win! And this brings us to the very last backyard sports game to be released within the Neo Sports era. How fitting, this era began with Backyard Football and now we're ending it with the exact same sport. Backyard Football 2006, released on both PC and the PS2, feels different enough from the prior 3D game in 2003 to have its own separate title released. Sure, some of the game's programming and models might have been reused, and by this point we've been over so many football games that I don't feel the need to really explain how it plays because other than the new kick meter, which you have to time first for power and then for accuracy, there's nothing new with how this one plays compared to 2003. Instead, I'll focus on what the game does do differently. First things first, the game brings the treehouse back. Okay, well, it's not technically the same treehouse as before, but the main menu screen does take place inside a treehouse that scrolls from left to right depending on which menu option the player currently has selected. That is really cool and a nice callback to the earlier games that sort of got lost after the second era came in and took over, so... That's awesome. Chuck Downfield and Sunny Day are in the game as commentators, but unlike all of the other 3D sports games that would cut to them and show them talking before each game, it instead just gets replaced with this camera swooping in over the field while they talk over it, and then it gets directly into the game itself, which is a shame because that means that backyard skateboarding marks the final appearance of Sunny Day in between character shots. Hi there, football fanatics! Sunny Day here, along with the human Charlie horse, Chuck Downfield. Good night, Sunny. On that note, let's head to the game. She isn't completely phased out of the franchise yet, but she's only going to be appearing as a 2D PNG, if at all, from here on out. Field-wise, we actually have a complete overhaul present here as all of the available fields to play on are brand new. There's this cyan field, which is kind of similar to the Dimitri Dome without exactly being the same thing. There's a purple schoolyard, which is really cool. Honestly, these fields felt pretty refreshing to see and the overworld that you get to cycle around when choosing between all of the possibilities was a nice added touch, reminding me of Yoshi's Island. Obviously, the roster was updated because when isn't it? And yes, there are unlockables present in the game for achieving certain feats. Although surprisingly, there is only one unlockable stadium in the entire game, which is none other than the humongous Memorial Stadium looking pretty different from the versions of it that came before. I know I said that 2003 was my favorite football game so far at the time I had talked about it in this video, but honestly, I think I even prefer 2006 to 2003. Red! Hey! Going for a screen pass here. G pulls it in. That was oh. a big boy Ouch. throw. No gain on the play, and they might have lost some yards. I only ever had one instance where it felt like the computer was being unreliable, and it was this moment here where it managed to avoid nearly my entire defensive line by shrugging off all of these different players going in for a tackle. I just don't get it, man. Like, that guy should have been down long before he made it that far, but 
whatever. Other than this one moment, I never felt like the game was unreasonable. And hey, another positive I can give it is that there are actually more players on the field now. The team rosters have increased up to 7 kids from the previous 5 that were available in past titles, providing for more options and plays to choose from when navigating the ball around the field, so that's pretty cool. The backyard football tie-in on the Game Boy Advance, however, is the exact same game as before, except it looks worse. This is one of the best examples where it truly feels like the developers at Taurus Games took the exact same game that they had already made three years prior and just made a few tweaks here and there and called it a day. The differences are minuscule at best. The user interface was updated in some places but not others, and the few places that were changed in my opinion look worse than the first game. For instance, the main menu screens. The player roster was obviously updated too to remove some inactive players and make room for some of the up and coming big names that were making their way onto the scene, but instead of the incredibly crisp sprites of the original character designs, this game used uses the second generation of Backyard Sports Kids designs, and they weren't even made specifically for this game. It just looks like the designs from the PC Backyard Sports games were compressed down, and it looks so much worse because of it. Like, compare how crisp and clean the 2003 version sprites look compared to 2006. It's such a downgrade. And this extends to the actual gameplay too. While 2003 had super bright and crisp field sprites, 2006 just said, eh, give them less detail and the game just suffers because of it. Now sure, there are a few new fields here and there like Chinatown, but a lot of the fields that were in 2003 just get reused here too. Honestly, the only major difference I could find during actual gameplay was the fact that there is now a recommended play feature that the game automatically decides for you, so you can use it if you want to, but you aren't forced to. Honestly though, I just mashed through and accepted it each time because it was faster to get through and I don't really care about backyard football games. This game, along with every single previous one, except for Backyard Football 2003 and 2006, the console edition specifically, I just don't enjoy them. And yeah, ultimately, I find that the GBA version of Backyard Football 2006 is probably the laziest re-release of any backyard sports game thus far because it actually managed to become worse than the version that came before it. Unlike other re-releases, which, at the very least, were of a similar quality, if not better. Now one thing that I do want to bring up very briefly at the end of this section of the video is that this is actually the very last video game that Humongous Entertainment would ever work on before its parent company Atari would dissolve it on April 1st, 2006. It should be said that there was some sort of agreement made where Humongous had to publish any games that it was currently working on before the company could dissolve it, but those games, if there ever were any, were never released, thus marking the official end of Humongous Entertainment as a company. Backyard Football 2006 was its swan song, and while being a decent game, not exactly the best note to end on. Theoretically, this means I could stop here, seeing as this video is in a series of videos that are centered around Humongous Entertainment specifically. However, given the fact that I've already talked about the other games released that were based on Humongous IPs, such as the Freddy Fish DS game and the Wii ports of a few titles, and given the fact that I will most likely never have this opportunity again, I may as well go all the way and discuss every single Backyard Sports game ever made. After all, that is what I promised at the beginning of the video, and... We're here now, so may as well continue onward. So, with that said, I just wanted to give a brief reflection on the games Humongous did produce before continuing onward. I really enjoyed a lot of these titles, although some were clearly better than others, and it's just a shame that Atari decided to abuse the company and the property the way that it did. Humongous Entertainment never deserved this, and I wish things could have worked out differently that would have allowed the company to continue releasing gaming titles even to this very day. Alas, March 31st, 2000. 2006 marks the final day of Humongous Entertainment's existence, with Backyard Football 2006 being that final curtain call. Not an amazing note to go out on, but if things like the callbacks to the original treehouse and the design of the Humongous Stadium were anything to go by, it seems like the team behind this game knew it was only a matter of time before the company would come to an end and made any last references that it could before its utter demise. Backyard Sports doesn't stop here though, as the remaining games that we have left to talk about in this video were all published 
published under a rebranded company that Atari named Humongous Incorporated. Although it should be known that this is a completely separate group of people from those that worked on all backyard sports games under Humongous Entertainment. Just because they have the same name of Humongous does not mean that it is the same group of people. And as soon as we dive into some of these games in the upcoming sections, I think that will become pretty clear. That said, let's go ahead and reluctantly move on to the next section. Let's take it to the next level. And so the third era of backyard sports, what I like to call the Dark Age, has begun. Following the closure and dissolution of Humongous Entertainment, Backyard Sports took a major nosedive as the series experienced a total reboot and or rebrand that feels so separate from the games that came before it, it's hard to believe this is meant to be the same franchise. The cast of original characters remains the same in the game, so names like the Del Vecchios, Webbers, or Khans are still present here. Dimitri, Pablo, Marky, and Luann are all present and accounted for, but, uh... Greetings from Earth. I am Dmitry Petrovich. Yeesh, they do not look anything like what they did before. Gosh, it's almost insulting what Humongous Inc. did to the series. I mean, this is just terrifying. They're the original characters in name only. One Actually, whoever plays even better number when number Sydney for outs. Right off the bat, pun intended, these character models are just flat out ugly. Their ginormous hands, their lanky bodies, the way their eyes just stare into the abyss. Honestly, they don't even look like kids anymore. They're teenagers now, at the very least, given their near uniform height. Like, Pablo, what did they do to you? And don't even get me started on the intro they came up with that was meant to be a consistent opener that would continue to be used across all games released under the new branding for the next several years. Hey baseball fan, I'm Albert Pujols. Welcome to Backyard Baseball 2007. Get in the gang and play. That compression, ugh, what is this? A flash animation on Newgrounds in 2006? Kinda does look like that, doesn't it? I guess it's interesting that they got Albert Pujols to make an appearance in the opening considering he was a pretty big name player at the time, but yeah, get used to seeing this because this is definitely not the last time it will be showing up. Backyard Baseball 2007 does introduce some new original kids to the roster for the first time since the first ever Backyard Baseball game though, which is interesting and worthy of note, in the form of Joey McAdoo, Arthur Chen, and Samantha Pierce. Not sure why Atari felt the need to add these three characters after removing nearly a dozen of the originals, but hey, here we are. Gotta differentiate the rebrand as much as possible, I guess. Okay, okay, this game can't be all bad, right? I mean, sure, the visuals look awful and the character models have been completely butchered, but the game can still play well. Uh, let's take a look at the new and deteriorated Backyard Baseball 2007, starting with this menu screen. Alright, okay. Looks like we have the usual choices here. There are options for minigame modes like Home Run Derby and the Fielder's Challenge. Uh, there are some unlockable things that I don't care about and won't bother going for. Okay. Yeah, standard backyard baseball options that we've already seen in the past several titles are still present here, so not much has changed in that department either. Well, I guess that only leaves two things to talk about, field selection and general gameplay. Getting the former out of the way first, yeah, I think there's actually a pretty solid field selection here. In fact, this game contains an entirely new, 
fresh and original set of environments to choose from that haven't been featured in any previous Backyard Sports game. These fields range from the burger joint to the warehouse, and there are also two unlockable stadiums in the form of the Haunted House and Giant Gymnasium. Okay, made it. How is everyone? Baseball and burgers. Not much better than that. Well, baseball and hot dogs are pretty good. Someone garlic fries. Ever had that? Now the game. And immediately, I'm sure you'll notice the distinct lack of Sunny Day and Abner Double Play. Yep, unfortunately, as a result of this rebrand, all of the Backyard Sports commentators just got Order 66 and wiped from the franchise. It's a shame too, I really like their color commentary a lot of the time, and this new announcer doesn't sound like he wants to be here at all, if I'm being honest. Comes to the plate. Swing. Good live heater that time. Offers one. Swing. Really fooled him there. Didn't expect that one to drop in. And here is the pitch. Can't blame the hitter there. That screwball had great movement. I am pleasantly surprised with these fields though and fully welcome that change. It really started to get repetitive seeing the same fields in the games over and over and over again with only like one or two new locations at most per game. This is a complete overhaul and as far as that goes, I think it's this game's best aspect. Playing on these fields, however, is a bit of a different story because the actual gameplay really sucks. And the pitch. Swing! Goodbye, Battle! baseball! The game still plays similar to before with the pitcher being able to choose the type of pitch they want to throw and aiming it accordingly, only now you have to aim the pitch as the pitcher is throwing it rather than aiming, selecting your spot and then pressing the A button to confirm it. I'm perfectly fine with this change when it comes to multiplayer because while I haven't played any multiplayer in any of these games myself, I'd assume this gives the person at bat an advantage because they can see exactly where the pitcher aims the ball. You know what? In fact, let me test that really quick with a couple of games to see. Keeps a favorite gift tucked away in the back pocket. Here's the pitch. Let's it fly. A screwball. All right, interesting, so that answers that question. On the hitting side, there is no longer a difference between grounder and line drive. Instead, the bunt feature has been split into bunt right and bunt left options, while line drives and grounders have just been merged into one swing button. The power swing is still available as a separate option though. And fielding, ah oh man. I don't know. I feel like these characters run too slow in the field to where it's extremely easy to get several bases on hits that in previous games would be reasonably balanced. What used to be a double in older games is now an inside the park home run here. The AI programming for my own teammates also seems to be garbage because in what world would a base runner on second with less than two outs run on a pop fly sent to the outfield? And delivers swing batter. I don't know, but my teammate sure thought it was a good idea and ended up giving the opponent a double play of which there was nothing I could do about. I saw my base runner take off as soon as that ball was hit and in this footage I am mashing every possible backwards direction that I can think of. Triangle for second base, up on the D-pad for second base, the right shoulder buttons to indicate backwards, right on the D-pad to indicate backwards, either there's a really dumb command that has a player run back to the base they were on, or I just don't think it's possible. I had another instance occur where I told my base runner to run to second on a base hit accidentally and he took off for second base, but as soon as I did this, I began mashing right on the D-pad and circle, again, like in most other baseball games, but he would not turn around. He just kept going and by some miracle, he ended up getting there safely. But man, having to essentially commit to a run like that with no option to head back, that's just broken and this was never an issue in Baseball 97, 2001, 2003 or 2005, so why is it suddenly one here? Let's it fly. Swing Crush, foul. Oh yeah, that was something cool. 
I'm completely changing the subject, but there's a level of interactivity in some of these fields like the warehouse windows getting smashed that gives each location an extra semblance of character. Honestly, this was a level of detail that didn't need to be included in the game, so it's cool that it's there at all, although I do wish there were a bit more sections in each field like this to really spice things up. Having that level of interactivity when a player gets a hit really switches things up and makes things more exciting. All in all, while I don't think Backyard Baseball 2007 is unplayable, it severely lacks the heart, charm, and personality that the prior games held. The characters being completely butchered is probably the cardinal sin of it all, but I just don't see any reason to play this game when Baseball 2005 exists. I am not a fan of this rebrand, and this is far from the worst of the Dark Age that I'm sure we've seen, so why don't we go in a little deeper and take a look at what the handheld counterpart of this this game was like. passed over his backyard as a field this year. His dad just put in new grass. They were ready for that one. Not able to bring Okay, so I'm actually going to be doing something a little bit different here. Rather than tackling the GBA version of Backyard Baseball 2007 along with its console version, I'm instead going to group this with two other GBA titles into one section because there were actually three different handheld games released in 2006 for three different sports, and quite frankly they're all remarkably similar to each other, then this classification will probably make the most sense once we get into these. So let's begin with Backyard Baseball 2007 for the Game Boy Advance and boot this bad boy up, shall we? Oh, so it's just Baseball 2006 again. Same minigames, same exact gameplay, same menu and user interface except slightly worse than before, truly the only differences in this game is that the Aquadome and Boardwalk are gone and replaced by the Country Airport and Weber Estate from the console version. Quantum Field has been changed to Area 51, and the character sprites have been updated to match the new designs for some characters, but not all of them. Ahmed, Pablo, and the Weber Twins, yeah, they've got their new designs, and boy are they unappealing to look at. But then you've got characters like Annie Frazier and Lisa Crockett, who didn't make the cut in the console version, but are still in this game using their old sprites from 2006. So basically, the game goes halfway in updating anybody that's a part of the 2007 rebranded roster and just left everybody else in the game who got cut out of the console version without updating them. Talk about lazy. Other than that, and a slight roster update for the new season, it is the literal exact same game as before. And I thought the 2006 version of Backyard Football on the GBA was lazy. This is the least amount of effort you probably could have given, aside from actually just publishing the same game a second time. But hey, it can't get any worse than this, right? Well, I was dead wrong, because the 2007 version of Backyard Football on the GBA is even lazier. At least, Backyard Football 2006 was bothered enough to tweak the field sprites of the characters and add the recommended play feature. Backyard Football 2007 does nothing new. Literally nothing. It is the exact same game as 2006. Here is every single change that I noticed between 2006 and 2007. Are you ready for this? Because I honestly can't believe it. Dimitri Dome and Phillips Field are now permanently snowy, so they removed a sunny and rainy option for those two fields. They added one new field in the form of Woodland. The player card sprites have been updated to the same ones they used in the 2007 GBA version of Backyard Baseball, meaning they didn't actually actually make anything new and they just copy and pasted, change the player swap button from the L button which was in the 2006 version to the B button in the 2007 for literally no reason, and they made the menu screens uglier. Seriously, how is it that Backyard Football GBA went from this 
to this. It's so bland and visually unappealing. The giant white screen just gives it this awful color scheme that I hate looking at. Like, what honestly happened here? Of the three GBA games made for 2007, football is easily the worst of the three, but don't get me wrong, the third game still has plenty of flaws. You guessed it, Backyard Basketball 2007 for the Game Boy Advance. I'm sure using the previous two titles as context clues, one would infer that this is also just a re-release of the same game that came prior, and you'd be right. This is the exact same game as the 2004 version, except unlike the other two games, this one actually does add things in the form of these two minigames called Block Shot and Ball Spin, but they aren't very exciting or fun to play. But hey, they did go to the trouble of at least adding some thing new to this game, so credit where credit is due? <laughs> I don't know, I don't think it's really credit at all. Otherwise though, it's the same as before. Updated roster with ugly sprites, a worse looking user interface, the back alley ball court was replaced by the Weber Estate Court, and game programming that was copy pasted with updated player models that probably had the most effort out of the three games because here they actually had to go to the trouble of remaking every character sprite in the updated art style. I don't really like the new art style as I've said before, but it is clear to me that Backyard Basketball 2007 on the GBA has the most work put into it of the Trinity, although all of them are still incredibly lazy, low effort re-releases. At least when Humongous Entertainment would re-release their sports games in the past, they would go to the trouble of adding more content to it or improving things so that the games were still on the same level if not better than the other one that came before it. These three games managed to be worse, and that is why I have such great disdain for them. I have very, very little nice things to say about these games. They are just low effort copy pasting with slightly different branding, and to think that Atari thought that they'd get away with publishing this is just, ugh. Normally I can at least say that the most recent re-release of one of these games is the one that I recommend playing, but not in this scenario. Go back to 2006, go back to 2004, play those versions instead, don't even bother with this. This is just shameful, utterly shameful. And so, the Backyard Sports 2007 rebrand continues with the next game in the series, Backyard Basketball 2007. Alas, it seems we have reached another substantial point of significance as this game marks the final ever Backyard Basketball game that would be released. Yes, we once again have reached the end of another Backyard Sport. How sad. And sad it is, because this is undoubtedly the worst Backyard Basketball game in existence. As if the characters weren't lanky enough in Backyard Baseball, here their proportions are severe severely exaggerated in the sport of basketball to the point where never in a million years would you be able to convince me that these are meant to be children. No, they're not even human. They're just abominations. The intro is also just as ear grating as ever, although this time it's actually greeted by NBA player Paul Pierce who does the intro clip. Hey basketball fans, this is Paul Pierce of the Boston Celtics. Welcome to Backyard Basketball 2007. Now get in the game and play. It's got the same menu style and layout as Baseball 2007 did, seeing as we're into this new era of backyard sports games, but don't expect this consistency to continue for much longer. Unlike the GBA version, the console release only comes with horse as a minigame and nothing else. No around the world, no block shots or hot shots, no ball spinning, just plain old horse. And honestly, the minigame plays itself most of the time that it hardly feels like I'm even doing anything at all. He fires the jumper. He takes a jump shot. 
the shooting mechanics are so ungodly broken and dumbed down that it just isn't fun to play, and the players are automated 90% of the time so you hardly get to control your character running around the court. The field selection is decent. There are some courts that cross over with the same aesthetic as Baseball 07, but there are a few original courts as well. Gameplay wise though, this is an utter nightmare. The players move absurdly fast, almost like the game is full on nitro boost mode at all times, but that is completely contrasted by that lackluster announcer who once again couldn't care less about what he's commentating over. Oh yeah, it's time to play the best game on earth, basketball. That's enough blabbering from me, let's roll! Like, dude, at least show a little enthusiasm. In truth, the Backyard Basketball 2007 gameplay is an utter mess because none of it works. Stealing? Doesn't work. Blocking? Doesn't work. Shooting? only when it wants to. And what I mean by that last part is that unlike the previous iterations of the sport, this game has no sort of power meter or shot accuracy calculator programmed into the game whatsoever, meaning all you do is press the triangle button and hope the ball goes in the hoop with no consistent form of knowing whether or not you'll make the shot. I mean, on one hand, this prevents players from just abusing three pointers all the time, the way I do, but at the same time, pure luck-based anything in video games is something I'm personally always against because the player has has no control over whether or not their shot would go in. A little bit of luck, sure, but at least allow the player to influence the outcome themselves and increase their odds. You just press the shoot button and hope for the best. There's no immersion present and no skill-based timing that allows a player to influence the likelihood of them making a basket. It is just completely up to whether or not the game wants to let you score as far as I can tell. Maybe there is something that influences it, but in my experience, I couldn't figure it out. Pressing the button down longer didn't seem to have any effect on my shots, nor did standing still before shooting the ball versus pressing the button while moving. I suppose I can mention that power-ups are still a thing in this series, and just because there was a rebrand doesn't mean those have gone away, but they aren't very exciting most of the time, and I only really had an opportunity to test out a few while I played this game. Backyard Basketball 2007 wasn't just released on home console in the Game Boy Advance, however, as the Nintendo DS had become pretty popular by this point in time and Atari wanted to dip their hand in the pot to see what they could do when it comes to making a profit at every possible outlet. Thus comes Backyard Basketball 2007 for the Nintendo DS. This is probably my favorite version of the three games that I've talked about so far, but by no means is that saying much of anything at all. At the very least, the characters don't run around at the speed of sound up and down the court, and the shooting actually has a power meter again, so this game actually gives you some level of interactivity when it comes to attempting to shoot a basketball. Given that this is a game that utilizes two screens, Backyard Basketball on the DS uses the top screen to display the actual scoreboard for the game, which is nice because it's way easier to look at the score than have to pay close attention to these tiny numbers on the Game Boy Advance's screen. The actual game takes place on the bottom screen, although I didn't notice any touchscreen controls at first, but that is because touch gameplay is actually off by default. You have to go into the options menu and turn it on yourself to use them. The character models, honestly, don't look half bad. I mean, the DS's 3D graphics are decent and the kids are way less lanky than the console version, which pulls it away from the uncanny valley issue that I had. The user interface is also nicer, and it's great that this game isn't just a total blatant rehash of an already released game the way the Game Boy Advance version was. Was. One thing I can give the game credit for, however, is that for once, its court selection is consistent with the console version because areas look nearly identical, albeit in a lower resolution, so that's nice. Gameplay-wise though, I mean, it's still 3v3 gameplay, although I find passing and controlling the characters more reliable because they aren't juiced up on caffeine, but I gotta complain about the stealing mechanic because once again, it flat out doesn't work. Miss. Three point. Yao Ming clearly swiped that ball from the computer right there numerous times, and not a single one registered as a steal. I tell you, I was mashing the steal button at plenty of opportunities where I swear I should have taken the ball from the opponent, and not once did I ever successfully pull it off. Nor did the computer pull it off on me. I'm convinced it doesn't actually work. Either QA testing didn't spend very much time on it, or there is some absurd condition I'm missing here that's preventing me from taking the ball. Honestly, for a Nintendo DS sports title, I think the game 
is fun, although shooting is much harder to do than previous games without being reliant on luck in the way that the console game is. I find that the computer isn't always the greatest at predicting where the ball is going to land though because I had several instances where this had occurred during some games and I was just kinda dumbfounded by it. It's just silly more than anything else. But yeah, overall I like the DS version of Backyard Basketball 2007 an okay amount. Could not care less about the other two though. They're both atrocious in their own different ways. It's a shame Backyard Basketball had to go out on this note though because even though it's not my favorite sport or anything close to it, I had a decent amount of fun playing the other games prior to this year's releases. I don't see myself ever returning to these games again so I did at least want to acknowledge that this is the last time I'll be talking about basketball in this video. Okay. Well, there is one other game that I'm going to be talking about, but it is completely different from how any of these other ones play, and we are not quite there yet. Classically speaking, this is the last backyard basketball game. But that just leaves three other sports remaining, and unfortunately, the next game I talk about is the last of its kind as well. He shoots from downtown! Get that kid. And so we have the last ever Backyard Hockey title, released exclusively on the Nintendo DS as there was no console counterpart released alongside it. But it does still retain the same Backyard Sports branding that the other games released in 2006 and 7 had, complete with the low quality intro and everything. Honestly though, out of all the handheld games with said branding, Backyard Hockey for the DS is the best one they've made gameplay wise. Now the game is not without its shortcomings, namely that all of the arenas are ripped right from the 2005 game so there are no original rinks to be found whatsoever. Of course, the player models share the same ones seen in Backyard Basketball for the most part, obviously having the basketball pros swapped for the hockey pros at the time of release. Mini games include a brand new shootout mode that I'm honestly surprised was not implemented into the previous two hockey titles because Backyard Soccer has something like this all the way back when Humongous was first gaining traction with the Backyard Sports series. And of course, Air Hockey returns with this vertical top-down perspective where you now get to control the puck with the stylus on the touch screen while the opponent remains on the top screen. It's a fun distraction, but not the main reason why anyone would get the game though. It seems we have a new standardized menu for all of the dark era Backyard Sports games by this point as the UI is pretty similar to the backyard basketball and baseball games that weren't just blatant re-releases, of which I think is fine enough. All of these games really do lack the side modes and extra content that other sports games are usually good at incorporating in order to switch things up and have more variety in the gameplay. Most of the backyard sports titles I've been talking about in this video have almost all just been so focused on playing matches that there wasn't anything else except for the occasional mini game here and there. Except for football, which gets nothing. Gameplay still consists of the 3v3 overhead view, which is now possible thanks to the Nintendo DS's 3D graphics capabilities, and the characters all control decently well. Passing and shooting is the same as before, but I find it a little more difficult to aim a shot on goal in this version because the characters are restricted to just the bottom screen, which makes it really hard to see when you're having to shoot on the goal at the top end of the rink rather than the bottom end. The computer also likes to do this maneuver where it just spams the shoot button over and over again whenever it gets up close to your goal. which feels like a completely broken mechanic that players would normally find a way to abuse, but the computer is the one that actually manages to pull it off here, whereas I can only replicate it once or twice because most of the time when I would take a shot on goal, the goalie would instantly grab the puck, whereas for whatever reason, my own goalie just refused to grab it. Not sure if that was something I had control over, like if I was supposed to press a button on time grabbing the puck or whatnot, but hey. One interesting mechanic that I really liked is that power-ups don't just spawn on the ice now, but instead, both teams have to 
to build up to it by shooting and passing the puck around with their teammates to slowly build up their meter, and once it fills all the way, then the team receives a power-up as a result. I actually kind of like this idea, building up to a special maneuver rather than relying on luck and random spawns to have one show up. It's interesting. Yeah, in all honesty, Backyard Hockey for the DS hasn't really disappointed me too much, at least compared to several other handheld titles. I had decent fun with this one, and I'd be happy to say this is a fine handheld hockey game for the series. Of course, it's the only one, so there's nothing else to compare it to on the DS, but one functional game is better than a dozen re-releases of the same game every year with little effort put into switching things up, so I'll take what I can get. New year, new game, same exact intro as before except it's introduced by pro athlete Tom Brady because I guess this just became a recurring thing that the series started doing with every 3D title it would release. Hey football fans, I'm Tom Brady, quarterback of the New England Patriots and two-time Super Bowl MVP. Welcome to Backyard Football. Get in the game and play. This time around, the Backyard Sports series has moved on to the next console generation as Backyard Football 2008 was released on not only PS2 and PC, but also the Nintendo Wii, which is the version I'm using for this video because I was curious to see how the motion controls would play out. So starting off, we've got a new menu screen once again, so it seems that the 2007 games were extremely short-lived because it was instantly replaced with this stationary and admittedly less interesting interface. It still works fine, but I kind of like the dynamic back background that would rotate around the specific sports equipment, you know? There are still no extra mini games or side modes because I guess it's just impossible to come up with mini games for the sport of football. Seriously, I don't understand why the other big sports all got these extra side modes added, but backyard football was just like, nope, we can't have that. I don't know, personally speaking, a challenge where the player has to progressively make field goal kicks 10 yards further and further away from the goalpost sounds kind of interesting if you ask me, but hey, that's just one idea. The characters once again retain the same names as before, but they are not the same designs as pre-Humongous Inc. It is worth mentioning, however, that this game was actually developed by Farsight Studios for the first time. So if I had to guess, this probably has something to do with why the art style of the background kids changed and we strayed away from the lanky teenagers that those 2007 games had. The models are fine, I guess, but, and I cannot stress this enough, the backyard kids have seriously lost a lot of their personality over the years just like people when they get to adulthood. You should pick me because I love to play all sports. Okay, I kid, I kid, but no, in all seriousness, these kids have become nothing more than empty shells. It used to be that each of them would have a distinct personality. I mean, you could literally get a perfect idea of exactly what they were like just by clicking on them on the bench and listening to a couple of lines that they had to say. The designs were varied and extravagant. The representation was incredible. And while the latter is still present here to a degree, it still can't compare to what those older games had. Even most of the console games managed to maintain most of their personalities when the designs did change, but I tell you what, as soon as Humongous Entertainment was dissolved, any sense of life and passion was sucked right out of this franchise, and that clearly shows with what we're looking at now. At the very least, I can say that the game plays fine, but I've been saying that about a lot of these more recent titles. Now, in my time playing this game, I found it to be pretty buggy, as I noticed several instances where a pass would be ruled incomplete despite the fact that I was clearly still in the field, and the character had received the pass no problem. It's a fake! Incomplete! Case in point. Bridging off of that, I found my teammates to be extremely unreliable, even more so than in previous games, which is hard to believe, because literally none of them bothered to cover these two receivers and just gave a wide opening to essentially take the ball from their own goal line all the way across the field for a touchdown. Yeah, it's stupid. This is exactly why I hate football games, because I can't control what the other teammates on my team do, and they're just dumb. Always. QB drops back in the pocket. Touchdown, O'Rooney! Sure, we all like a touchdown celebration, but 
How do you think the football feels? There aren't any intrusive motion controls with the Wii version of the game. All they're really used for is to pass the ball, except now in this game, and the thought process behind this decision really baffles me, there are no longer buttons that appear on screen to indicate where the quarterback is going to pass to. Instead, it's up to the player to pay attention to the buttons that appear on the play selection screen and press it themselves when they actually run it, which is dumb because A, there are so many of these plays and the buttons switch around here and there so I never remember which receiver is where, and B, the button showing up below the players was never hurting anything in the first place. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. I don't see why such a convenient feature was removed in this title, but lo and behold, here we are. Oh man, somebody's mom is gonna be peeved. At the very least, Sunny Day has come back from the grave to return to co-commentate this game alongside Chuck Downfield once again, so it seems they survived Atari's command for Order 66 after all. At least, temporarily. Greetings, sports fans! Sunny Day here, joined as always by the world's youngest retired football player, Chuck Downfield. Thanks, Sonny. <laughs> I'm all grown up now. I definitely prefer 2006 over this game, no question. The field selection here is fine, but I definitely preferred the options available in the previous game. And yes, there are unlockable players in stadiums like normal. Power-up mileage may vary, as I found some to be way more useful than others, and yeah, I think that about sums it up. Out of the way, here comes the bull charge! That smells like a power-up! P.U. <laughs> For the console version anyways, we still got a DS game to talk about here. So Backyard Football 2008 on the DS. It's remarkably similar to hockey and basketball in the sense that yes, it has the same intro, menu style, and aesthetic, and logo, but it's probably the most different out of all of the DS games because this one actually feels like it's just a rough translation of the GBA games with the camera shifted from the sidelines to the overhead view of the 3D titles. Those 2007 GBA games had terrible menu interfaces though, so I'm very glad that improvements were made to that in these DS games. But one thing that I wouldn't necessarily call an improvement is the fact that the character models aren't actually real character models in this game. Yeah, know how basketball and hockey had actual 3D characters for everyone that you could view in the locker room? That's gone. Instead, they're just flat out pixelated 2D renders that just look terrible. I think the reason for this is because the character models on the field weren't worth making detailed enough due to the camera angle and the distance from the screen, although I don't know how much of that I'd buy because they were pretty far from the camera in Backyard Hockey DS2, so I could be completely wrong there. Maybe it was just a lack of willingness to make the models. Still no mini games, of course, but the field selection is decent. I like the campgrounds and resort field while it was snowing. Honestly though, if I could sum up this entire game in one clip, it would be this. Kick off. Actually, you know what? No, this is how I would sum the game up. Kick off! Kick off! No joke, it is ridiculously easy to return a kickoff all the way for a touchdown if you use your sprint meter wisely because holy cow, that was nearly every drive I recorded footage for aside from like maybe two or three. The computer's AI is just terrible when it comes to defense. Probably the worst I've ever seen it. I mean, these guys don't ever stand a chance when I'm returning a kick. Probably 80% of the time, I would just run into the end zone and score a touchdown without even having to try. Of course, the AI for the defensive players is garbage 
on both sides as there really was no excuse for my own team members to not be able to tackle the opponent in several situations, but then again I've experienced this in practically every backyard football game which is why I don't like them. I also never witnessed a single interception or incomplete pass in the DS version. It was as if the precision of throwing was perfect every single time, which was downright shocking to me. There was one big thing that happened though that I absolutely have to call this game out for though, and I feel like I've had a clip like this in the past three backyard football games, but hey, it continues here. Pass complete! absolutely absurd. There is no way that the computer should have been able to avoid going down for that long. I mean, you can't convince me there wasn't any foul play going on there. The game is honestly a complete broken mess, just like the Wii version, and I can't recommend this one in good faith because of it. I mean, if you want to mess around and see what other ludicrous plays you can make occur, be my guest. But you're not going to have a very fulfilling experience with this one because it's just janky through and through. Hopefully seeing the footage on screen helps my case of this feeling like an exact translation of the GBA games, but from a different angle. I can't call it as lazy as the 2007 version because this game does do more to set itself apart, but I still have a sneaking suspicion this game still reused the same code as before, and I think I can make a case for that. Obviously, the game reuses assets from the GBA titles, what with the available plays and the field goal animations and things like that, but my sticking point for this is the way the characters behave whenever they score a touchdown. Now, I didn't bring this up when I discussed Backyard Football 2006 on the Game Boy Advance, but a weird thing that I did notice the first time I played it is that for some strange reason, whenever a player scores a touchdown, they run over to the center of the field while everybody else celebrates. Every single time. It doesn't matter if it's the player who scored or the computer. The one that makes it in the end zone with the football just ceases what they're doing and walks to the middle of the field for no reason while everybody else looks at the camera and cheers. I can't figure it out. I don't know why it does this. I thought maybe it was to represent them doing some sort of victory dance, but no animation plays when they get there. They just stand motionless, as if their soul just left their body and all that remains is a lifeless husk. And yes, this carried into the 2007 version as well because that game was a blatant rehash with no original merit to it whatsoever. In the DS version of Backyard Football 2008, once again, they do the exact same thing, even though the game runs from a different camera angle. Touchdown! Seriously, what is going on here? Why are they doing this? It has to be a bug. It is so weird that this occurs, and again, it happens every time, no exceptions. I would understand it if there was some sort of animation they do where they slam the football on the ground or they jump in the air, you know, to celebrate, but they just waltz on over there, look at the camera, and stand still. What a strange anomaly. Anywho, I think that covers Backyard Football 2008 in a nutshell. Both of these games were certainly odd for different reasons, so they most certainly stand out for being in the dark age of backyard sports. Honestly, at this point, it hardly even feels like I'm talking about the same franchise anymore. Like, sure, there's still kids playing football, but the physics, graphics, fields, players, the way the game is even made, none of it is reminiscent of the original 90s games now, and I know that I've hardly been paying attention to the roster changes other than acknowledging that, hey, the roster changes changed, I think, but that's because it's just so minuscule at this point. Oh look, this game has Donovan McNabb instead of Dan Marino. That one had Albert Pujols, whereas this one had Sammy Sosa. The original Backyard Sports were never about professional players, and they certainly weren't about releasing a bajillion different games each year. Well, ironically, except for 2007, because all that came out during this year was Backyard Football 2008, but hey, I don't know. Hopefully this video has been doing an adequate job of showcasing
introducing just how badly Atari milked this franchise to death because I don't know what more I could possibly say to convince anyone at this point in the retrospective. Honestly, kudos to you for sticking this long into it. I'm impressed with your dedication to such a gargantuan project like this. I really didn't expect a lot of people to make it this far. But I suppose we should just carry on at this point. Only a few more years to go, so why don't we go ahead and take a look at what was made in 2008 for the sports year of 2009. Let's play a game, right. Sonny. Every time a team gets a first down, you have to eat a buffalo wing. Come on, it'll be fun. <laughs> Alright, so by this point in the retrospective, I just need to be honest with you. With the exception of one game, it's nothing but football and baseball from here on out. The actual variety in available sports games has completely plummeted as soccer, hockey, basketball, and skateboarding had been completely phased out of the franchise by this point in time. Honestly, the fact that I've only gone a little mad making it this far into this project is surprising to me. I would have thought I'd be losing it by now, but I've still managed to find things to talk about with each of these games, so let's just keep chugging right along and get into Backyard Baseball 2009 on the Wii, PS2, and PC. Right off the bat, I just gotta say that Backyard Baseball 2009 was such a pleasant surprise to me that, quite honestly, I'm in disbelief that I liked the game as much as I did. I mean, I actually found myself enjoying it after about 5 minutes or so. It completely destroys 2007 as a game in nearly every single aspect. The physics are better, the controls are better, the hitting is better, the pitching is better, the characters look more like kids and aren't these uncanny string beans that look like Mike TV after he was put in the taffy puller. Throwing to each base feels very reliable again, although actual base running still lacks the ability to run backwards, so once you press that run to the next base button, you have committed just like before, unless I'm missing something of course. The intro this time around is hosted by David Ortiz of the Boston Red Sox, but otherwise the intro is the same compressed flash animation as before, and features a similar menu to the console version of Backyard Football 2008 that was just discussed prior to this game. Hey baseball fans, I am David Ortiz from the Boston Red Sox World Series Champions. Welcome to Backyard Baseball. Get in the game and play. Farsight Studios once again took the helm for this one rather than Game Brains who developed 07, and boy am I glad for that. By no means am I saying that this is a good game, at most I would call it decent. But compared to some of the other titles I just had to witness, this is a much needed improvement. Still doesn't match Baseball 3D though, that remains the king of the 3D Backyard Baseball games, but I'd say this one's second best. So what does this game do that's new? Well, the Wii version features motion controls because that was a big gimmick with the new console, which is fine. It's only really used to swing, which was pretty responsive in my experience, so minimal complaint there. The game features Home Run Derby and Fielder's Challenge, which have just become mandatory requirements by this point, and Home Run Derby actually operates on some logical rules that makes it fun to play, what with it being based on outs rather than a number of pitches. The thing that gets me is that the actual Home Run Derby hosted by the MLB never operated on the logic that was used in the previous games with there only being three outs or a total of pitches and then a player swapped out. Back when these games were released, the rules of the home run derby were always that a player had 10 outs per round and got to hit as many home runs as possible until they hit that benchmark. So strange that it took until Backyard Baseball 2009 to actually get it right. Baseball 09 also introduces a cool new mode in the form of the All-Star Game, which pits the National League athletes versus the American League in a head-to-head -head game featuring all of the pros just like how it occurs at the halfway point of each Major League Baseball season. Cool new mode, didn't really expect to see something like this, but hey, it would let me play on an otherwise locked stadium, so that was great I got to show that off. Speaking of stadiums, we have another batch of new fields to check out here in this game. The ones from 2007 are nowhere to be found as we now have entirely new locations like Curb Street Park, Bonsai Gardens, and Shadowland. Hello, okay, I'm picking this one. Home field advantage, baby. Mm. 
I will say one thing from 2007 that I wish was more explored here was the interactivity that could occur like in that shipyard level that I mentioned during 2007. I like the field choice, but I wish there was a bit more to them like the ones in the previous 3D title. Backyard Baseball 2009 also sees the return of Sunny Day commentating once again just like in Football 2008, and this time around instead of bringing in Abner Double Play or bringing back Vinny from whoever knows how long ago, we've got a new co-commentator in the form of Jack Fowler. He's okay. I, I guess. Sunny day along with the always enlightening Jack Fowler. Hey, Sonny, you ready for some baseball? We're coming to you from Granny Acres Ranch. The Baltimore Orioles are the home team. And the road team is the San Francisco Giants. He's fine. I mean, at least he doesn't repeat Sonny's name every five seconds the way Abner did, but honestly, I really don't care. The only major bug I even encountered with this game was that I somehow managed to strike out after only two pitches in this one at bat. The next batter is Samantha Pierce. This should be an interesting matchup here. One away in the inning and no one on base. Got on top of that one. Swings for the out, that's two. She missed that one completely. Don't ask me why this occurred, but if you pay close attention to when I hit that foul ball, you notice the strike count go from zero to two. So I'm not sure if this was some sort of weird glitch or if it was something that could be replicated, but either way, I found that to be on roughly the same level as that two point conversion play I ran in football 2008 that somehow also registered as incomplete. Though, Backyard Baseball 2009, while being representative of a shell of what the series used to be, was so much more enjoyable than whatever was going on with Baseball 2007. Of course, given the common trend that seems to be going along with all of the console games, yes, a handheld port was made for the Nintendo DS, bringing the four primary sports full circle and having all four of them on the DS, just like the GBA. For this game in particular, well, hey, it's taking cues from basketball and hockey rather than football and being a game that isn't just a translation of a previous handheld game, but rather taking its own approach with full-on 3D models for each player. Interestingly enough, this game actually uses the top screen to not only show the score, but also the positions of each player on the field. And it does this weird effect where it magnifies the head of whichever player currently holds the ball on the bottom screen, so it's an interesting way to kinda track what's going on during each hit in the game. Now, I could be wrong about this, but it feels like the DS version of Baseball 2009 is actually running on the same engine as the console version of Baseball 07, or at the very least, that the entire game is based on 07 in the same way that Hockey for the DS was based on the 2005 console version. The fielding is extremely snappy, almost like you need an insanely quick reaction time in order to make certain plays happen, but hey, at least base running is based on using the touchscreen now rather than using the buttons, and for what feels like the first time in forever, you can actually run backwards again. Finally, after all this time, something that should be a basic feature implemented into every game as a bare minimum requirement has been included here. It's about time. But yeah, other than that, this feels like an exact tie-in to Baseball 2007. Case in point, same fields, same speedier fielding gameplay, and same lack of thrill that I experienced in the PS2 version. This doesn't feel like a handheld counterpart to 2009 so much as it is a counterpart to 2007 released a year and a half later. At the very least, the field selection is back which you probably remember was what I praised most about that game, and yeah, it continues to be solid here. Also, the Home Run Derby and Fielder's Challenge are available here, but I figured that goes without saying at this point, and unlike Football DS which decided to cut corners with the player models, here we have full-on 3D models for everybody again, likely because these are actually used for each player when they're up to bat. So again, this isn't really praiseworthy so much as it is just an acknowledgement of the bare minimum being met. Yeah, I'm not impressed with this one so much. It's fine for a DS baseball game, but like, it's based on the worst backyard baseball game, so there's no way it was ever going to be good. Overall, I can definitely recognize Baseball 2009 on the Wii as the superior version of the game. It's not great by any means, but it feels a little bit better than any of these other Dark Ages sports games. It's fun, probably something to mess around with maybe once in your life, but even still, it just doesn't compare to the titles of the previous generations. Still, I guess it's a bright spot in an otherwise dark era. That's a deep fly ball, could go all the way. Adios, amigo!
Backyard Football 2009, though, it's the exact same game as 2008. Nope, I'm sorry, they added a little 09 in the corner of the logo there. Okay, that totally justifies re-releasing the entire game all over again with the misleading title that it's a brand new game. And this isn't the first time that Atari has pulled this maneuver either, but hopefully it illustrates one of the big problems with most yearly sports titles in that it's the same game every year with a new roster and maybe a new side mode here and there. I've probably said this several other times during the course of this video, but considering how long it is and how much time it passed between each of these entries that I've written, I kind of forgot during that stage. They couldn't even get another pro athlete to do the opening greeting before the intro, so they just reused the Tom Brady one again from the previous year. In fact, the only updates that I even noticed were that they added the Lava Dome and Grainy Acres Fields, and updated a couple of the other ones a little bit, such as changing the color of the carnival's grass, and moving the baseball field and brick field from being off to the side to in the center of the area. Roster updates? Probably. I didn't really care enough to check. There are at least two new game modes in the form of the Pro Match, which is like the football equivalent of baseball's all-star game where it's a bunch of pros versus pros in the Humongo Dome, so at least I got to show that field off. Hey, hey, hey! QB drops back in the pocket. That QB is down. That QB might want to think about a new sport, like, uh, knitting. The second mode is tournament mode, which is exactly what it sounds like. Eight teams in a single elimination tournament to see which one comes out on top. I'm sure this could be fun if you had a group of people that could all pick a different team and you play against each other to see who wins, but otherwise this mode doesn't really have too much going for it. Did I also mention how annoying Chuck Downfield is in this game? They score! When you get a touchdown, that usually results in six points, and that's a good thing. I wonder why they call it an extra point. Oh wait, I know this one. Joining me today, as always, is our very own lovable lunkhead, Chuck Downfield. Thanks, Sonny. <laughs> I'm all grown up now. First and ten. It's like some Great. kind of metaphor for something, isn't it? Thanks, Sonny. It's great to be back. And you'll be happy to hear I'm no longer contagious. Yeah, those clips were only a taste of some of the awful, awful dialogue that he says in this game. And believe me, it's fun at first, and I know kids would probably enjoy some of the lines the first couple times, but he begins to repeat himself very, very quickly, and I got sick and tired of it after the first quarter of my first game. Now is the time of the show where I read letters I've received from my adoring fans. Uh... Unfortunately, I don't have any. Gameplay-wise, it's the same controls, same camera and layout. They added buttons below each receiver to indicate who to throw to, so I suppose that's nice. Except they don't actually do anything. No matter what direction I press on the D-pad, the quarterback only ever throws to the same one receiver, so your input literally does not matter because it doesn't work. I was going to praise them for adding buttons below each character because that was something significantly lacking in 2008, but it doesn't work. So hopefully you see where I'm coming from with my emphasis on why this is such an issue. I mean, before Backyard Football 2008, this was never a problem in any Backyard Football game. Sure, sometimes the players would suck at catching, but at least the quarterback always threw the ball to the player I was intending it to go to. Also, the AI of my own team's defense is still incredibly stupid. Like, they literally just let the other team get away from them to score. I can't rely on any of them, but I can also only control one player at a time, so there's just no winning here. Here. These football video games suck. I'm sorry. The DS game isn't much better because just like the console version, it's the same exact game as the year before, except now the camera is zoomed farther out and the interface was changed slightly. Still the same gameplay, same player behavior, same reused assets from the games that came way before this on the GBA, same audio, same fields. Oh, but hey, the player screen changed from those awful pixelated scans of 3D models to these 2D profile drawings of each, so I guess that's a little better? Maybe? These are replicating the design style from that wonderful Flash animation that plays at the start of almost every backyard sports game post-2006, but this is like the only improvement I can actually find in the game. Oh, wait, no, there is one more thing. Yes, just like the previous two games when a player scores a touchdown, they do the exact same thing where they run to the center of the end zone for some arbitrary reason. But now, unlike the previous three games, they do a little victory dance. See? Look at him go! Totally worth publishing the exact same game again under a slightly different name to make it seem like it's a brand new experience. Kick off.
Honestly, I had some nice things to say about 2008, and I don't rescind those comments, but I have nothing good to say about 2009, because there is hardly anything to differentiate between the two, both the console and the handheld version. In retrospect, the Wii version of 2009 is the superior version of 2008 because it has more features, so I would say go for that one over 2008, but what else is new? Considering I'm making this retrospective from a chronological point of view of when the game came out, that's why my perception of it is so negative. The DS version though, honestly, I guess it just depends on if you prefer an over-the-shoulder camera or a super far aerial view, because really, that's the only distinct distinguishing factor between those two games. Eh, <sighs> I'm not satisfied with either of these. Shame. First and goal. You've got Three. four chances here to get some points, so don't blow it, bucko. They're in for the score. I think someone's got a case of touchdown fever. And bringing us into the year of 2009 comes just a few more backyard sports games. Believe it or not, we're actually reaching the tail end of the franchise here. We only have a couple more to go before the end. Crazy, right? Well, unfortunately, this section's gonna be a bit brief. I mean, the fact that this is the first time I'm combining 3D console games should be enough of an indication of that. Well, the reason for this is that all three of these are just more re-releases of the same games I've already talked about before. Backyard Baseball 2010 on the Wii is just Backyard Baseball 2009 on the Wii again, except now the castle is locked and the lava dome is accessible so I could finally show that field off. David Ortiz is still featured at the beginning and the user interface is cleaner. The only noteworthy changes are that the camera has changed to an over-the-shoulder angle to mimic how baseball is normally televised when in single player, and they added a former backyard baseball field in the form of Gator Flats from the first 3D baseball title, so at least that's a nifty callback to a previous game. Jack Fowler's voice was also changed to some random indistinguishable kid who's got nowhere near as much personality as Chuck Downfield in Football 08 and 09. I'm Sunny Day. Joining me, as always, is my good friend Jack Fowler. Hey Sonny, holy cats do we have a great game today. Also, I swear they adjusted the batting sensitivity or timing window to hit the ball because it was not as difficult to get hits in the 2009 version of this game. I literally tested these back-to-back -back timing my swings and found that, yeah, I was getting way more hits in 2009 than 2010. Maybe it's just me, but I swear there's a difference here. Other than those minor changes though, it's the exact same game as before and the DS version of Baseball 2010 isn't much better. The biggest change is that the fields have been updated graphically so that there is more color and detail put into them, such as minor layout changes and added grass here and there. The game retains all of the fields from the previous title, but also has added fields like the Clover Hills Field and Curb Street Park Stadiums. The user interface also received an overhaul too, which looks nice, and the voice clips of Sunny from the console game have replaced the previous announcer's commentary, which I also think is an improvement. Seriously though, the graphical quality got a major increase, so at least some effort was put somewhere. I will say, however, that the biggest change I noticed is that the hitting situation is the opposite of the console version. Here it feels like the hit sensitivity was made to be way more forgiving because I was belting home run after home run in this version of the game and that was something I was not capable of in the 2009 title. I mean just look at this. The pitch. Hit to left field. Pitch is on its way. And it's gone. The next kid steps up to the plate. So wind up in the pitch. That one's hit to center. Get out of here. The next batter steps up. The pitch is on its way. I was most definitely not capable of pulling that off in 2009, that's for sure. 
As with the console games, I even went back and played the previous one for comparison, and sure enough, it was much harder to hit the ball, so I'm convinced there was some sort of tweaking done to the games in that regard. I do want to go back to the graphical thing again though, because seriously, if you compare footage of 2009 right next to 2010, the difference in quality is night and day. It's almost like it advanced another console generation with how much better it looks. Seriously, my compliments go out to the people who actually bothered to spend time making the game look better, because 2009 looked terrible. <laughs> I'm just saying. Don't have much more to say on Baseball 2010 though, so moving on to Football 2010. It's the exact same freaking game again, and it has even less differences between it and 2009 than 2009 had to 2008. Do you want to know the only changes that were made to this version of the game? I'll tell you. The year on the logo was modified, they removed Tom Brady's opening introduction, and they cropped the standard opening animation for some asinine reason, I'm sure. Roster changes are likely, and there may be some new voice lines from Sonny and Chuck, maybe, but I'm not sure because I haven't heard them all. That's it. Everything else is a direct carbon copy of what came before. The passing issue is still persistent in this version of the game too. Controls are identical, no fields have been updated from what I can tell. Maybe I'm missing a few other changes here and there that I just didn't see, but I can't be bothered to look for tiny details when the game overall is the exact same thing I've had to play twice already. Can you tell I'm getting tired of talking about football video games yet? Hey! Drops back to pass. Give up or throw or what? They're in for the score. I will eat an entire pie every time someone scores a touchdown today. Starting now. Whew, well, that's all I have to say on these three titles. Second verse, or in football's case, third verse, same as the first. I am so over these games and can't wait to move on to whatever happens to be next. I'm certain it can't be as lazy or terrible as this. Deep fly ball could go all the way. Kaboom! Oh, Pablo. What did they do to you? Oh my gosh, and the Weber twins, Tony, Dimitri. <sighs> and so begins the fourth and final era of backyard sports, one I like to call the identity crisis era. Although it's not a very large era seeing as it consists of a whopping six games total. Four if you group in handheld titles with their console counterparts, spread five years in between each other. It's uh... Well, let's just say we're in for a bad time. Backyard Sports Sandlot Sluggers is the first of these titles in this final era of the Backyard Sports franchise, and I think the character designs alone already speak for what we're about to get into. I mean, how did this franchise go from this to this? is nothing sacred. Okay, so what does this game entail? Well, the title was released on the Xbox 360, Nintendo Wii, and of course there was a Nintendo DS version as well, which I'll be getting to shortly thereafter. For this video, I'm looking at the Wii version specifically, although honestly the only major differences between the two versions mostly lie in the control differences, what with the Wii being all about swinging the remote to hit and pitch, whereas the Xbox was played with a controller. At the very least, I can say that Sandlot Sluggers feels like it's trying to do something new for the franchise even if it doesn't feel like it even belongs in the same group as the previous entries. There are quite a lot of changes here to go over, so let's get the smaller ones out of the way first. No more pro athletes. After however many games that we've gone over, what? Every single game since Backyard Football 1999? Every one of them has had pro athletes, but this is the first to just completely do away with that. Was this because of some sort of issue between the major leagues and Atari, or was this just the company not wanting to have their games tie in with the pros anymore? Can't help but wonder. If I had to guess, maybe the cost of having an athlete featured on the cover was not worth what the game would end up selling for. But yeah, the pro athletes are completely gone and so are the likes of Sunny Day and Jack Fowler, who are now replaced by these two old men who honestly shouldn't be co-commentating over children's sports games. The home team coming up to bat here in the bottom of the inning. The teams will switch sides for the bottom of the inning after 
Look, I'm not the kind of person to make the obvious jokes here, but like, who honestly thought that replacing a kid commentator with an elderly man was a good idea? Probably the same person that thought these designs were appealing, and that it was necessary to remove over half of the original cast and only leave a select few kids left in the game. Seriously, you want to know how many of the original characters are here? Pablo, Dimitri, Tony, Vicky, the Weber twins, Kaisha, Joey, and Jorge are the only backyard kids in the game. Period. No more Ahmed and Amir, no more Dante, no more Lisa, they're all gone which may be a blessing in disguise. The game features a story mode for the very first time ever though, so why don't we check out the opening cutscene and get an idea of what this is all about. It was a dark and stormy night. Igor had broken out of captivity. Ron, Ron, focus. Let me wait, begin. Wait, wait, I got it. Call me Ishmael. You done now? It all started one perfect afternoon at Meadowbrook Field. Oh, I love this story. Are you gonna stop interrupting me? Maybe. <sighs> oh man, that's bad. While this particular day at Meadowbrook brought a new set of kids to the neighborhood, led by none other than Jimmy Winthorpe Knuckles. The notorious bully? That's right. He was the biggest bully ever. Anyway, he was no fun to play with. He used to bully the other kids and thought that the point of baseball was only to win. What did the other kids do? Tragically, they eventually no longer played in their backyards. Baseball began to quickly disappear from the neighborhood, maybe forever. Yes, the entire story mode of this game is based around this bully who bullied everyone into not playing baseball anymore. Okay, well then, how do we go about taking down this bully then? This new kid quickly realized that all the other neighborhood kids would have to join forces to beat those bullies at their own game. Slowly, a team began to form. Not so fast. He had to prove to him he was up to the challenge. By beating them at their own game. You're serious. You mean to tell me that this kid bullied everyone into not playing baseball, so in order to solve the problem, we need to beat all of the other neighborhood kids at baseball so that they will join our team and defeat the bully in a game of baseball? What happened to the part where the kids were too scared to play baseball anymore? Was that just forgotten about despite it being the crucial detail that the entire conflict of this story hinges on? And why do we need to beat the other neighborhood kids first in order to convince them to join our team to beat the bully? What do we have to prove? Just have everyone team up, beat the pulp out of this wannabe kid, problem solved. Okay, obviously I'm reading a bit too deep into this, but when the entire story mode is hunched around such a simple, straightforward premise, and yet it can't even abide by like the one important conflict that it set up, come on, you gotta call that out. But yeah, the story mode is as simple as that. Beat all the other kids, then take down the bully, case closed. The other big feature is that for the first time in forever, the minigames have finally been updated. Home Run Derby and Fielder's Challenge are no more. Instead, now we have five new minigames available to play with up to four players. Of course, I don't have friends, so I played this by myself against all the other computers, so... The five minigames consist of dingers, which, okay, yeah, it's just still the home run derby, so I guess that's not gone after all. There's also breakout, where you need to smash the different colored targets in order to score points, which is fine enough. There's this pickle game, where all you do is shake the Wii mode as fast as you can to try and either score or tag the runner out before they do. It was fun, but really simple. Fourth is the Simon Says game, just throw the color-coded pitch at the block first and you score a point. And finally, there's Hot Potato, where each player needs to keep the ball away from themselves before it goes off. Yeah, none of these are particularly amazing, but hey, at least they're trying something different and they all function fine, so by all means, that's of note. The actual gameplay though? Yeah, not much has changed between this and the last game because lo and behold, it's baseball. It's not like the rules of the sport are ever altered drastically. You still use motion controls to pitch and throw, obviously on the Xbox version these are replaced with buttons. You can choose the swing and pitch types as before, there are power-ups, same same old, same old. The only glaring issue I ran into is that for some reason once my fielders picked up the ball, they would stop running altogether for literally no reason. It did not matter if it was an outfielder or the first baseman, as soon as they picked the ball up off the ground, all control was lost and I had to pass it to another player in order to complete the play. A programming error of such capacity led to this happening a lot. safely at 
first. And all I can do is roll my eyes at this point. When this video is over, I don't want to play another baseball game for a long, long time. And football and basically any sports game at all. FIFA? 2K? Madden? No thanks, I'll stick to more creatively driven games, thank you very much, I'm tired of this crap. Last but not least, I guess the field selection is decent. The quantum field, which looks nothing like it did previously, is just pollution central now, that's exciting I guess. Don't let Captain Planet see this place or he might have an aneurysm. But no, in all seriousness, the field selection is fine, I'm just really tired by this point. But what about the DS game? Surely that could be better, right? It all started one perfect afternoon at Meadowbrook Field. Oh, I love this story. Are you gonna stop interrupting me? Maybe. <sighs> yeah, no. Sandlot Sluggers on the DS is a literal exact translation of the console version with four of the five minigames removed and controls being adjusted to fit the touchscreen so that the game can be played with the stylus. Same field, same characters, same exact story mode cutscenes with the same announcers and all. The only things I even feel like pointing out with this game is that A, I hate how navigating the menu screens is forced with the stylus when you can still play the actual game with the D-pad and face buttons, B, most of the fielding in this game is controlled by the AI so you never actually have to do anything as far as I've experienced. Once again, the game plays itself, and where's the fun in that? And C, trying to time your swing in this game is a borderline impossibility. I swear where in no other backyard baseball game is it this difficult to hit the dang ball. I know I commented on this in the past, but I take it all back. This game is undeniably the worst offender when it comes to timing swings. I mean, I swear that should have been a hit right there. And the strike zone is so inconsistent too. I mean, how on earth did that register as a strike? Don't get me wrong, the console version is extremely hard to time too, but compared to the DS version, at least that one seems somewhat doable. Here though, getting a hit next to impossible. This version of the game is miserable. At least I could see some level level of fun being found in the console game kinda if you look really hard, but nope. This is terrible, unfun, frustrating nonsense. I don't see any level of merit in the DS version, I'm sorry. But yeah, if 2007 was the equivalent of the franchise getting shot in the back while 2008 and 9 were the last glimmers of hope before everything began to fade to darkness in Football 2009 and the 2010 games, Backyard Sports Sandlot Sluggers is the sound of the body hitting the ground. Yeah, maybe there were some cool ideas here, but largely the franchise was already dead at this point, and now all that's left is the final whimper in the form of its football counterpart. Oh boy. Alright, so moving on from Sandlot Sluggers comes Rookie Rush, the football equivalent of the new Identity Crisis era. This game features a lot of the same from Sandlot in the sense that it uses the exact same character designs and similar features as before. It really comes across as though Atari had no idea what they were doing with this franchise by this point because any sense of identity from the original games has been completely lost to the past. If you've ever wanted to play generic sports kids video game, look no further because this couldn't get any more bland if you ask me. Backyard Football Rookie Rush is such a dull experience that it literally made me question what I was even doing with my life while playing it. Why am I making this gigantic retrospective on every Backyard Sports video game? Why am I torturing myself? These were the only thoughts running through my mind as I slogged through this dreadful waste of time. And here's the thing, as it stands, Rookie Rush is an okay game. It controls well, graphically speaking it looks alright for a Wii title running on Dolphin, and passing isn't broken anymore, so when you push a direction on the D-pad, the game actually throws it to the correct player. One downside that I don't like of the gameplay, however, is that the new user interface is a little counterintuitive to navigate because plays are broken down under these weird names that don't really explain what the plays are, and once you select an option to move down a level in the menu, you can't cancel out of it and go back up, so if you accidentally choose the wrong category, you gotta pick a play from it whether you want to or not. All the previous Backyard Football games never had this issue, it feels like every single game that I come across, one issue gets fixed but another one presents itself. Can you tell I'm going a little bit mad by this point? Story mode, that's a thing I guess. Yeah, so this one is the same exact concept as the last game with a slightly different premise. Ah, uh, Meadowbrook. Hey, I got a parking ticket there. Hey, there's my bank. Hey, remember when Jimmy Knuckles played that game there? Memories. Don't eat there.
you know, if we ever actually get to the premise of the game. Once the dust had settled on Dimitri, the kids saw the flyer announcing Phineas's fantastic football funfair. The grand prize was not only the coveted Phineas Cup, but being on the cover of the newest backyard sports video game. <sighs> it's a competition to see who can win the football funfair trophy and get their face on the cover of the next backyard sports video game. Joke's on them, this was the last backyard sports game to ever get a physical release under Atari. The irony. Looks like whoever organized this competition couldn't follow through. Story mode is structured like before, with the player being able to recruit all the kids in the neighborhood to take down this ace character. Except unlike baseball, where you can choose any of the kids in any order you want, you're only able to choose a few from the start and have them gradually unlock the rest as it goes along, which I don't really see a benefit of it being restricted this way, but hey. Also, Ashley and Sydney have been separated onto two different teams now, rather than sharing one, like in Sandlot Sluggers. Hello there, today the rising stars are taking on Pablo and the big city bears. Pablo's team is always a tough one to go up against. He just seems to be good at everything. Similar to that game, Rookie Rush has five mini-games just like before, in the form of this catching game where you have to catch as many footballs as possible with the ones that match your color giving you bonus points, there's a game where you have to make it into the end zone without getting tagged by the bulldog, a game where you compete against three opponents to sack the quarterback first, an obstacle course that you can run through as fast as possible, and finally a throwing game where you need to hit as many targets as possible to get a high score. Once again, these are fine enough side distractions and it's nice to see some developers actually trying to come up with some football games game seeing as believe it or not this is the first ever backyard football game to actually have mini games and go figure it's the last one they ever made oh did i forget to mention that MVP. Look at those moves. that'll send you crying home to mummy yep this is the last ever backyard football video game ever made and I could not be happier. Okay, yes, Rookie Rush was also released on the Nintendo DS. It's the exact same game as the Wii version, just like baseball, but adapted to two screens. You choose plays in the exact same manner as before, story mode follows the exact same progression, the mini games featured in the console version are not present here, I don't care anymore, it's not a fun game, end of review. I wish I felt something, any sort of sad or nostalgic emotion out of knowing that, but honestly, all I can do is celebrate. I have had such a bumpy relationship with these football games that I'm just relieved it's over. I've only enjoyed like, what, maybe 20% of the football games I've had to play for this video? Out of all the sports that I've discussed here, backyard football has consistently been the worst one of them all, and I am incredibly glad that I am finally done with this. Sheesh, Identity Crisis era is right. These games really had no idea what they wanted to be anymore and had no sense of identity left from the previous eras of the franchise. And that's why they were the last entries in the Backyard Sports series for the better part of five years. Once Atari filed for bankruptcy in 2013, the rights to the Backyard Sports franchise exchanged hands a few times before eventually going to Day6, who had other plans for the property once they had acquired it. Where did that lead to? Well, there's the punt. Deep freeze. He's cold up there. Gets clear. Those grass stains are going to be permanent. Following the release of Backyard Sports Rookie Rush came a five-year dormancy as I said as the parent company Atari had filed for bankruptcy and sold the property off to the Evergreen Group, who then immediately sold it to the Day6 Sports Group not long after. The next and final two games I'm going to be looking at in this last section of my video will be covering these titles, but I do want to at least acknowledge the announcement of the theatrical film in 2016 first, because yes, somehow people thought this franchise was capable of serving as the basis for a cinematic release. Don't ask me how or why, it sounds like a terrible idea and I can't imagine it would be very good. 
but somebody thought it was a good idea. Unfortunately, ever since the initial announcement, nothing has ever come of it, so for all we know this project is dead in the water. It could very well come back someday in the future after this video is finished and released, but as somebody who just witnessed this entire franchise from beginning to end, take it from me when I say, nobody needs this. Alright, so, Backyard Sports Baseball 2015 and Backyard Sports NBA Basketball 2015, both released for iOS and Android devices before inexplicably being taken down from digital stores without word or warning so that they are no longer able to play unless you go find the appropriate files, installer, and possibly an emulator for yourself elsewhere out there on the internet. I'll be upfront with you all. No matter how hard I tried to get these games to install on my phone so that I could play them for myself, I just couldn't pull it off. After lots of roundabout steps that I did not have to perform the last time I did a video on mobile games, the farthest I could get with it was the choose your avatar and name screen where it unfortunately cropped itself in a way that I was unable to scroll down and press continue. I could choose one of the top three avatars on screen, but that's all I could do, meaning all of the footage you're about to see is taken from the following YouTube channels that I'm showing on screen now. As such, this also means I do not have any experience actually playing these games for myself, so I can only go off of what I've seen rather than played. That said, I feel that the term Identity Crisis Era is a perfect fit for these two games just like the previous ones because my lord, how did we get to this point? Regardless, it seems that a lot of the same backyard kids return here once again. Dante Robinson is one who's actually returned from the grave. The Weber twins, Pablo, yeah, they're all here along some other MLB or NBA All-Stars, but there's a far smaller selection than what there was previously, and most of the pros need to be bought as microtransactions because that's the nature of mobile games and is a big reason why I don't play them. Both apps feature similar user interfaces, which look fine enough for a mobile game, but surprisingly, they only feature four courts or fields each, and they're the same four for locations for both games, Boardwalk, Scrapyard, Steel, and Weber Estate. No, not Steel Stadium, just Steel. I don't know what that means. I get it's a callback to the first Backyard Baseball game, but like, why is it just called Steel? Gameplay-wise, basketball seems fine, it's just the same game as before, but with touchscreen controls where you drag the player across the court with your finger and tap to pass or shoot. Baseball, you do similar actions by tapping to pitch and swiping to swing. Very basic, bare-bones gameplay that honestly just feels like a higher resolution version of the Nintendo DS games, if I'm being honest. Only on one screen. There's also a... well, uh... Hmm. Okay, I think I've officially run out of things to say about the Backyard Sports games, so that's probably a sign that I should end things off. Sorry if it felt like I've barely spent any time on these games at all, but what more can I really say? They seem fine, but I don't enjoy mobile games, and just watching this footage I know I wouldn't have fun with it. I've subjected myself to enough torture as it is, so I'm just ready to be done with the franchise at this point. Sucks that we have to end on such an anticlimactic note, but hey, the franchise had already been buried six feet underground at this point, and this was a feeble attempt at bringing it back to life. Good riddance, I say. Two points. And that's the game. Final score. <sighs> well, that was one bumpy ride, wasn't it? Over 50 backyard sports games in existence, and I just finished covering them all. Let this video stand as a testament that I am, indeed, insanely dedicated to this humongous entertainment project, despite the fact that I doubt very many people have even made it this far. But hey, I made this not to only say that I did, but also to be the first person to do it, and that alone was a driving factor that continued to push me through this, no matter how much of a slog some of these games could be at times. Do I have any regrets? Mm, no, but you better believe me, I will never do something like this ever again, because it was not worth it, and I doubt it ever will be even if I made a million dollars off of this video. But at least I can relax knowing that my humongous entertainment retrospective series is nearing its completion. As of this point, I have officially talked about every single video game humongous entertainment has ever released, but honestly, if I ended the series here, that would kind of be a bit of a disappointing and downer note to end on. I mean, I feel drained after having gone through this, and that's not the kind of way I want to end this series. This is meant to be a celebration of the company that made the lives of many 90s and early 2000s kids all the better, not a reflection on how awful Atari was and how they completely butchered an otherwise wholesome franchise. As such, I'll not be concluding this retrospective series here and now, and instead ending it off on one final celebratory wrap-up video in which I will be ranking every single junior adventure game that Humongous had ever released. I figure, one final revisit to some of my favorite childhood
childhood computer games can't hurt, right? So stay tuned for the final video of my humongous entertainment series. Until next time, Shadow Streak signing off.